The wonderful thing about being at the stage at which we are, you know, with this hybrid kind of engagements that we have to do as a consequence of COVID-19, is that the people who are in the room are as important as the people who join us online. So thank you for those of you who challenged yourself and who came physically to this place. I am a very confident Namibian at the moment. I had my vaccination done about 14 days ago, exactly today. So yeah, I, I, I must say it makes me feel more confident to go to public venues. We must still take the same levels of care, of course, to mask up, to sanitize, to do the social distancing, which we are abiding by this morning. Uh, but for those of you who are watching us uh, from the comforts of your offices, your own homes, um, remember that when you're around people to do the same and to go out there and get your vaccination done as quickly as possible. Um, I'm honored then for us to kickstart this event and just to ensure that those of you who are watching us uh, or who are also in the room are feeling welcomed, let me ask Mr. Shiho to come and just quickly deliver a welcoming uh, note and then I'll take you specifically through the program for this morning, which will really, is, you know, will be composed of a panel discussion later in the morning and then first we start off with a highlight with a public lecture. So, Mr. Shio, if you can just come and welcome everybody, then I'll come back to just go into the details as regards the program. Thank you. Uh. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I am a bit blessed with being tall. <laughs> Um, key stakeholders, uh, invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, really thank you. Thank you so much for being here and uh, for joining us for this today's event, actually, about the public lecture as well as the panel discussion. I just want to say that uh, on behalf of Internet Society, an Namibian chapter would like to say that uh, we are honored to be part of this planned site event in celebration of the World Press Freedom Day of which Namibia is the host country for, for this year. I would also like to inform you that this is also not the only event that we are engaging on as Internet Society, but that we have other engaged or other planned activities also. We are currently also having an online um, journalist campaign that is currently running. And then also for the end of May or the last week of May, we are also going to have another event, which is uh, the training of journalists and that is also in collaboration with our key stakeholders and our partners in this. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to also point that all of this event and plans would have not been possible without the teamwork and support of entities and institutions such as the Namibian University of Science and Technology, NAMSHUE, uh, Namibian Media Professionals Union, as well as with the support of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, as well as Facebook also. And, uh, as uh, I would not want to actually take up most of the opportunity or all the credit, because this was really an initiative that was born and birthed by an idea that we got from the Namshue, as well as uh, with the support of Nashi Longo, who really came and saw the need of us to really come up with this idea and come up with these side events in commemoration of the World Press Freedom Day. So um, most of the credit really goes to the key stakeholders as well as Namshue. Against this background, I also once again want to welcome you to today's public lecture, which is going to be on taking stock on the importance of uh, digitization on the Namibian media landscape, as well as the panel discussion on media ethics uh, in a digitalized world. So with that, really, I just want to welcome you all, feel at home, and uh, let's engage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Shiro. Don't worry, I'm not too much behind you. I'm not as tall as you are, but I'm not Nashilongo either. I'm kind of like there in the middle somewhere. So thank you very much for uh, welcoming us. Um, I think we have context to why we are here. It's really an exciting time for us as a country. Um, it's a world with such interesting um, events and occurrences taking place, and it's just nice for us to, as a, as as 
you know, the media fraternity in the country just to have a focal point um, together over the next week. It's really leading up to the events which will take place from tomorrow um, until the 3rd of May, obviously with the 30th anniversary of the Ventuk Declaration. Um, I, I, I can't even remember. I keep trying to think, where was I about 30 years ago when this Vindic Declaration was signed? I, I, I'm at the stage now where I'm thankful that I can't remember having been in that room because if I were in that room, I must be very, very old, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm grateful that I can't remember too much of it. I do remember being in the media fraternity soon after that um, because I, I was one of the first uh, group of youngsters who went into the NBC at the time and then left for a while and came back again. Um, but yeah, um, wonderful to see the contributions that journalists continue to make to Namibia attaining number one spot in Africa in regards press freedom. It's obviously a battle. I think sometimes when the statistics are read, you think it's just like an accomplishment just like that, but we don't know the daily conversations which are tough and the territories be which are being fought over to ensure that that remains the case. Um, yeah, so it's worth us celebrating that. Now our speaker, um, Joseph had alluded to the theme, is Associate Professor um, Admire Mare. It's such a lovely name you have, Admire. Um, and I'm sure you've had several versions of it because I'm sure people don't believe that it's a name that I'm sure you're getting called all sorts of things. The name is Admire. It's that simple. It's somebody who's worth admiring. And when you look at his CV and you look specifically at his accomplishments, you will agree with me that he is worth admiring. And his students will bear testimony to that. They are also in the room and I'm sure some of them are following us online. But uh, Associate Professor Mare is from NAST, which is the Namibia University of Science and Technology in Vintuk, and he holds a number of degrees, such as a PhD and a Master's in Arts in Journalism and Media Studies from Rhodes University in South Africa, that's specifically from Grahamstown. And he's a well-published um, researcher with interest in social media and some of the topics we'll cover this morning, which will really focus on digitalization, etc. I always say that word like that because I struggle with the DG when it's next to each other, so I pronounce it like that so that I don't slip up on it. So the public lecture will focus on the topic, taking stock of the impact of digitization on the Namibian landscape. So we ask you specifically, those of you who are online, please post your questions. We will engage them a little later, and those of you in the room, uh, the same privilege will be extended to you. So will you please make welcome Associate Professor Mare. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Yoda. Thank you so much, Joe, for the introductions. Uh, I don't think I have to waste much of our time but to say that uh, I'm privileged to be in this room. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for the assistance there. Um, I don't want to, to talk about my name because, you know, as, as you would have said, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique name in many ways. I think you can only find it in, I think so far in my travels, I've found out that it's only in two countries. Uh, it's in Zimbabwe. If it's not in Zimbabwe, probably you are going to find it uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, in my travels, I actually realized that when I went to Sierra Leone, females there are called admire, and I was like, really? Okay. So it's, it's, it's a unique name in many ways, but it's fine. Uh, thank you so much once again for the introductions. Uh, I want to thank everybody who is here in the room, but I also want to thank those who are watching us online uh, for this particular platform. But I also want to congratulate uh, Namibia for retaining number one uh, in terms of press freedom uh, rankings. I think uh, wrestling that from Ghana was not easy, I know. Uh, neither even wrestling it from other countries that have come before us, I think it wasn't easy. But it tells you in terms of what the country is doing in terms of making sure that uh, the media operates in an environment that is not uh, constrictive. So because of my time, allow me to get on with the public lecture, which I have uh, you know, 
interestingly uh, titled uh, Taking Stock of the Impact of Digitization on the Namibian Media Landscape. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about taking stock here within the context of uh, thinking about balance sheets. And when you talk about, about balance sheets, what comes to mind often times is, uh, is the profit and loss. You are trying to see what is it that you have gained, what is it that you have lost as a result of you know, this pro process which we call digitization. So I think what is going to come out from this particular presentation is that we are seeing a lot of changes in the media landscape. And especially we, if you look back 30 years ago when the De Declaration was actually signed in this particular country, so many things have happened to the media landscape. A lot of things have happened. The media landscape has changed. The way in which we produce and package news has changed. The way in which we interact with our content as consumers has also changed. The business model upon which we anchor our journalism has also changed. Not only that, the media ethics that we also use in this particular digitized environment has also significantly changed. So there's so much that has happened over the last 30 years. And I think this particular lecture is going to shed light in terms of what has happened, what is likely to happen, and how should we react and respond to these changes that we are talking about. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have so many journalists in the room, but I, I know that most of them are you know, meeting us online because of, you know, deadline pressures and other things. But I think one thing that I just want to anger this particular lecture around is to say, going forward, I think the media needs to be very creative. It has to be a media that thinks out, outside the box, but also think without the box, because conventional ways of doing business have significantly been disrupted. And we are not going to go back to the old ways of doing things, unfortunately. In as much as we want to hold on to things that we know, the routinized way of doing journalism, you know, the routinized way of packaging our content, unfortunately, the media landscape in which we find ourselves don't allow us to, to operate in that kind of an environment. So we need to find ways to move on and to remain faithful to quality, credible, and truthful journalism. And I think that's, 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 that's one thing that I want to, to anger uh, this particular talk around. Let me just move on with uh, outline in terms of what is it that I'll be talking about. As I've already pointed out, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about journalism at crossroads, and I'm going to, to talk about what this crossroads is all about and what needs to be done to get out of this crossroads, because the crossroads we are seeing it has got significant impact in terms of how journalism is going to be practiced going forward. It has also got significant impact in terms of how we are going to consume content going forward as audiences. Then I'm going to look at the mid Namibia. Briefly, I'm going to look at the Namibian media landscape just to give you highlights in terms of what is really happening and what is likely to happen going forward. And then I'll move on from there. I'll, I'll, I'll look at what I call the circuit of culture. It's a framework that I often use to understand the impact of digitization uh, on media landscape generally in Africa and beyond. And then after that, I'll look at the, what we saw, the so-called disruptive uh, digital media ecology. What is there? What is it that is disruptive about this particular media ecology? What can we learn from this particular media ecology? What is bad about this particular media ecology? And what is good about it? And what can we learn and what we, can we do to make sure that we term this, uh, this beast called uh, digital, uh, disruptive digital, me digital media ecology? And then I'll look at the responses that we are seeing right now to these uh, so-called digital headwinds, especially in the Namibian context, and what it tells us about our creativity, what it tells us about our innov innovation, but also what it tells us about where we are going uh, as a nation. And then finally, I will start talking about recommendations, and I will offer pretty much concluding remarks thereafter, pointing ways where we can actually see uh, innovations uh, uh, going forward. So I, I've talked about, uh, I've, I've already talked about the crossroads issue, I think, when I was introducing this particular topic. I think one thing that you, you bear with me and also understand. Okay, let me remove this. I, we, are, we are accustomed to, to be always uh, with these masks because of the COVID-19, but it's fine. Let me remove it so that I, my, my face can be seen. Uh, so one thing that I just want to say is that when you look at journalism at crossroads, we are looking at so many things that has happened. Some are actually arguing that the business model of traditional journalism has been broken. It means the way in which we used to make money out of journalism is no longer the same. And the way in which we interact with our audiences is no longer the same. And in this cross, in these crossroads, it's a, pretty much what scholars call it's a zone of discomfort. It's a zone of no, 
no return. It's a zone of fluid things that are happening. It's a zone of things that you cannot even comprehend what needs to be done. So we are pretty much finding ourselves in a space where journalism is at crossroads. And I think wh what you can see from some of the images that I've put, I think you can see this particular report which says 40 journalists lose jobs since 2016. And this report demonstrated the state in which journalism finds itself. Increasingly, our young graduates are increasingly finding it difficult to get jobs in the newsroom. If they get jobs, some of these jobs are pretty much what we would probably call are uh, not decent jobs, probably they are interns or they are correspondents and they are not permanently employed because the space in which we are actually operating has significantly changed. And I think this is very important because it tells us that journalism is indeed at crossroads. But what needs to be done to get journalism out of the crossroads is what we need to think about. And that is the conversation that we must have in this room, but beyond this room, but also even globally to see how can we serve journalism? How can we serve the media in industry here in Namibia going forward? I think if you also watch uh, SABC, I think a few, a, few, a few weeks ago, you must have seen these particular images. These were emotional images, if you, if you ask me, because both, both uh, presenters cried while you know, trying to, 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 to give context about what had happened at SABC. Over 600 people had lost their jobs. And some of these people were their colleagues, some of these people were their friends, some of these people were their relatives. But in some of them were actually also affected. For example, the first one who was, uh, who used to read uh, the Indaba in, 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 uh, bulletin at SABC, she lost a job after almost 30, 40 years working at SABC. And it just tells you about the state of journalism, but it also tells you about the state of the media industry in Africa and beyond. And I think these are things that we may not, uh, uh, not need to, to, to look at them uh, as things that are just going to go away. We may not wish them away in as much as we may want to, 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 to ignore them. Then the question that we may come is that, okay, you are saying journalism is in crisis. What crisis? And whose crisis is it anyway? And I think it's very important for us here in this room to just you know, pause a bit and talk about what we call there is a revenue crisis in journalism. And it's, 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 it's at the core of these challenges that we are talking about. There is a revenue crisis which has crippled the way how we produce, how we distribute our public interest journalism. This revenue crisis has actually come to the fore because digital media spaces have taken away some of the advertising revenue that we're getting all along. So all of a sudden, Newspapers, radio stations, television stations are waking up to realize that their lunch has already been eaten by Google. Their lunch has been, is now being shared with Facebook. Their so-called uh, juicy, juicy bone is now being shared with Twitter. Their juicy bone is being shared with Amazon Prime. You know, all these kinds of platforms that are coming to the fore. And not only that, DSTV is also crying right now that Netflix has also invaded their space. So this is the crisis in which we find journalism. It's a, it's a deep-seated crisis. It's a crisis that requires people and also editors that think outside of the box so that they can actually be able to survive this kind of a crisis that we are talking about. Not only that, public service broadcasting is also in deep trouble. Not only here in Africa, but even ac across the world. BBC, the BBCs of this world are also struggling in terms of making sure that they, they remain viable, they remain sustainable. Increasingly, we are also seeing right now in Namibia, as we celebrate 30 years, that the, Namib the Namibian Broadcasting Corporation workers have been on strike for quite a number of days now. And it tells you the crisis that is faced by public service broadcasting. To what extent can governments continue to bail out our public service uh, broadcasters? And to, whose end, and to what end? And what are the results of actually continuously bailing out? Should we say the licensing model that we use to, to, to sustain this is outdated? If it's not outdated, should we commercialize our public service broadcasting uh, corporations so that they could actually be able to sustain themselves? What should be done? Should governments get out of the, the, the public service broadcasting uh, funding model? These are issues that we really need to talk about, and they are not easy issues. These are issues that require sober minds, but also require creative uh, minds to, to, to come to the fore. 
Again, the other issue that is at the center of this crisis is that traditional news organizations are no longer the only platform for advertisers. So advertisers have got a wide range of platforms through which they could actually publish and advertise their products. Long ago, yes, you would say, if I don't advertise with the Namibian, then I'm not going to reach a particular audience. Long ago, you could say, if I don't publish or I advertise through the new era, then I don't have access to my, to my audience. But now, we, are, we have gone beyond that. Our audiences are now on Facebook, our audiences are on Twitter, our audiences are on WhatsApp, our audiences are all over the show. So which means we will pretty much find ourselves in a fractured, uh, fractured media in the landscape where you don't just rely on one platform to get a message out. There are so many alternatives through which you can actually distribute this particular context. And I think this is where the crisis actually must actually allow us to start thinking about how do we get out of this particular crisis. So we are also saying this particular crisis has already started pushing significant structural changes where we are increasingly seeing digital only platforms coming to the fore, but also we are seeing more bio content kind of uh, productions also coming to the fore, but also we are also seeing the platform industry seen as seen by, uh, companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, actually dominating the media landscape, pretty much taking over from our traditional news sources. So the crisis is deep-seated and it requires a lot of introspection. Let me move forward and talk about the Namibian media landscape. And I think it's, it's very important for us to reflect on what is, what, is, what is the state of affairs now and what I propose going forward should be the way in which we react to some of these things. I, I, I want to, 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 to agree that our media landscape pretty much can actually be summarized as a crowded and competitive media, a market where shrinking advertising space is actually creating sustainability issues for the media industry in Namibia. So there's, there's a shrinking advertising space and so many advertisers are increasingly finding ways to advertise their own products through their own platforms, either through their own websites or through other cheaper means like probably going to Facebook straight and get access to almost like 7 billion people when compared to actually doing the same with a media company that only has got maybe uh, 100,000 uh, viewers or 100,000 uh, subscribers. So pretty much it's about making decisions about where do I, where do I send my product so that I can get the more eyes and more, more, more eyes and more ears. So it's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty business oriented decision that actually advertisers are making. And I think this is also affecting our media industry in Namibia. Over and above that, I, I, we all know that we are, we are the champion in terms of press freedom. If you look at the, the media landscape here in Namibia, it's pretty much uh, relatively uh, free from government interference, you know, notwithstanding, of course, the public service broadcaster, which is obviously funded by the state. But also we are increasingly seeing cases of media concentration where very few players actually dominate the, the print, but also the broadcasting sector. And that also has got a, a significant uh, impact in terms of the kind of content and the quality and the diversity of the content that we are likely going to, to get as a result of this particular media landscape. But also the other thing that I just want to say, there are also low levels of trust generally in the media, in the media industry. But thank God, because of COVID-19, all of a sudden, we have realized that audiences have started to realize that you need to go back to traditional media sources to get your truthful, credible news uh, sources. So increasingly, there's a temporary shift or a temporary trust boost that has actually been put uh, to, the, to, to, our, to our advantage as a media by COVID-19. How we are going to harness that is another issue. It's something that, of course, audit, ed, editors and other journalists must reflect on. But again, the other issue that is also at the center of this thing is that generally we've got low internet penetration in this particular country. Of course, we are over well, at least 52.1% uh, 52 according to the Internet World States uh, of uh, December 2020, which is pretty much a, 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 a better uh, reflection of where we are going as a nation. But again, it tells you that at least 48 percent of our population are still not in these platforms. And that also makes it very difficult for us to, pro pro to, to package our content for the whole country, or the whole country as, a, as a whole. 
again, the other issue that I also want to flag is the, the reading culture. Generally, our country doesn't have a, a high reading culture, but also even literacy levels ultimately affect how people consume content because if the people are not as, as, as educated as you'd want, certainly if you package your content in English or you package your content in German, chances are that the, most of the people that cannot read and write may not be able to, to access that particular content. And again, that also shrinks your, your, your audience uh, market because ultimately it means you are pretty much targeting people that are already, already literate. That's what you end up doing. The other issue that I just want to flag as I, as I, as I try to, to, to move with speed is that we have also seen, even in the Namibian context, changing news consumption patterns, with especially young, young, young audience actually preferring to get their content online. And that, that tells you a lot. But the unfortunate part about this is that young people that are moving online, some of them don't have disposable income. So even as much as an advertiser, advertiser would say, okay, should I package content for people that don't have any disposable income, even if they advertise with them, chances are that they're not going to buy the product at the end of the day. So it's a business decision that advertisers are increasingly making to say, yes, these people are moving online, but what about, what about, what about the disposable income? Are they going to be able to, do they have the buying power at the end of the day? Can they buy things at the end of the day? So that is another challenge that the media has to deal with, to say, should we follow the young people that are going online, or should we remain offline and connect ourselves with what? Pretty much connect ourselves with uh, the, old, the, the, the older generation, so to speak. Again, there's also an over-dependence on uh, our, what I would call advertising agencies. There's a lot of, you know, you, you depend here in Namibia with getting advertising agents acting as our intermediary. So we, the ad advertising agents would deal with, directly with the, with the client and then get back to the media, in, media industry and say, this is what, 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 what the client wants. This is what the clients want. And that model, I think, has to be disrupted. That's what I think. Going forward, it has to be disrupted. I think media companies must have one-on-one -on -one relationship with their clients. Otherwise, if, as long as we have intermediaries in this platform uh, in industry, chances are that people are likely to move on to other, to other platforms. Again, I've already pointed out, high cost of the internet also makes it very difficult for us to, to go full throttle in terms of digital journalism. It will affect the chances that we are going to, and if you look at it, most of the people in Namibia often use what we call social media bundles. So it's either you're on away gig or in super away, away, away and all that kind of thing. So all this makes it very difficult for you to have a full package of consum consuming co internet. So when you, inter when, you, when, you, when you consume internet, Based on bundles, it means your, your, your access is also limited. You can't access certain products because your bundle limits you to certain kinds of you know, platforms. And that is also a, a challenge. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, there's still a low, little appetite for people to pay for online content. I think that, if, that can easily be, 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 be talked about when you look at what uh, people do when they, they try to consume content on the Namibian Sun, for example, when you realize that there's a, there's a payoff, people just move on and go, go to the next person or next platform and then consume that particular content. So pretty much there's a low appetite for people to pay for content, unfortunately, that affects, again, Time, I think, is also really what, what is going to affect me, but let me try and move. Again, the other issue that I just want to flag is that online ads are not as financially lucrative as offline. So in as much as we want to follow online, but research has shown that in Africa and here in Namibia, they are not as, uh, uh, people would say, ah, if just to, to, to put my advert on your, on, your, on your website banner or as a website banner, I am not going to pay 100,000, I'm not going to pay. But if you say a full page, uh, for the Namibian, it's 90,000 or 100,000. They will pay that, but they will not want to pay the same online. So which means offline is still more lucrative than actually online, and therefore it means as, a, as, an, as, as an editor or even as a business owner, the, the chances are that you might likely to make more money offline still, even though we know people are moving online. And that also presents a dilemma going forward in terms of how, of how do you deal with that particular issue. Again, finally, let me, talk, uh, in terms of this context that I'm trying to shape, is that COVID-19, unfortunately, has also escalated this crisis in journalism. So we have seen here in Namibia, you know, so many newsrooms are surviving on what I'll probably call shoestring budgets. There are also a lot of salary and staff rationalization. So people are pretty much being laid off or probably being told to take a few days off or you work on part-time basis and things like that. But also there's a lot of 
falling sales revenue, decreasing circulation figures, which ultimately affected the industry going forward. And these are issues that are, are likely to, to affect us uh, for a long time to come. And then I sum up the, the crisis in, 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 the, in the Namibian media landscape by focusing on three issues. The media industry in Namibia has been affected by three things in the last five years, from 2016. The economic recession, digital disruption, and unfortunately, COVID-19. These three things have unfortunately compounded the state and the crisis in terms of media sustainability. Let, now, now let me just talk uh, briefly about what I have talked about um, in terms of what I call the circuit of culture. This is a framework that I often use to understand what really is happening, what has happened, and what are the drivers of these things that are happening. So I want to, to, to anchor this particular section by arguing that digital disruption has actually affected media industry at the level of production. So I'll start by focusing on at the level of production. So how we produce content, how we produce content has somehow been disrupted by this digital media landscape. And I, I argue that what we have seen as a result of these new media technologies that there's been a democratization of the communication space. So pretty much you are, everyone can actually communicate, everyone can produce content, everyone can be a content producer. And because of that, at the level of production, journalism can no longer claim that they are the only drafters of history or they are the only people that are responsible for telling us the truth. There are so many people that have come into this production space and you are pretty much journalism, journalists are sharing this space with its bloggers, they are sharing this space with citizen journalists, they are sharing this space with my grandmom who is in, in, in the village, pretty much. So it's no longer just journalists who are trained, professionally trained, that are in this particular space. And because of that, journalism somehow has pretty, pretty much been uh, disrupted. The other issue that I want to talk about is consumption. I think I've already tried to talk about this. At the level of consumption, again, journalism has pretty much been s significantly disrupted because all of a sudden, our audiences pretty much prefer to go online, especially in countries where you've got youthful population like Namibia, where over 60% of young people, or of, of people are actually young people, which means pretty much young people are going online and the older generation, which is pretty much around 40%, are still pretty much stuck in the offline mode. And that also creates a situation where journalists and also editors must think outside of the box to be able to deal with this particular issue. So again, young people have got shorter attention spans. That's the unfortunate part. So when you think that you are going to have a bulletin for one hour, young people don't want to watch a bulletin for, for one hour, which means you need to think ways of how do you get a 10 minute bulletin or a five minute bulletin that sums up the key issues of the day. So the way in which you are going to produce content somehow also has changed or it has to change. And that's why you see Young people are, are, are at home to watch Netflix because it allows them to watch things when they want to watch it, how they want to watch it, when they want to watch it. And these are things that we really need to see. And there is a change that is coming as a result of that. And I think the best that happened over the last few days around the Super League, Champions League, and what, and what the people that are fronting the Super League were saying is that we need to respond to our audiences because our audiences are increasingly saying we need a 30-minute game, not a 45-minute game. And it tells you a lot about what really is happening at, at a level of, of, of attention spans of people. People don't have time to watch things that are long and long, long reads anymore. Okay, let me move a bit. And then at the level of distribution, so I've talked about production, I've talked about consumption. At the level of distribution, again, we are increasingly seeing a shift from what we call analog. So you pretty much have your hard copy, you have got your TV, you've got your, your, your television channels. Pretty much what you are seeing, people are pretty much preferring to go the digital route. So pretty much you are seeing PDF newspapers, pretty P PDF format newspapers, you know, online content which is on your websites and all these kinds of things. You are seeing podcasts, you are seeing live streams. That's what all, generally the younger generation, that's what they want. They are not really interested in this other thing of saying, I wait for, for news at 8 p.m. so that I can know what was happening in Namibia. I want to see it as and when it is happening. So pretty much you have got a 24-hour rolling kind of you know, coverage that people are increasingly interested in. And then the other issue that I just want to flag is the issue of uh, the business model. The business model that we, offer, we generally used as, as journalists or as journalism was that would rely on, uh, we'll probably create a space where advertisers would come and advertise with us. So you give them maybe your first page or you give them a second page where they can advertise. And any other space that is left is the space that you're going to put your content. 
Unfortunately, that, that kind of uh, general revenue generation has been disrupted because people are increasingly realizing that it's expensive to go and advertise offline. So I'd rather go and advertise with uh, Facebook, which is probably going to charge me maybe five US dollars or 20 US dollars. And then they have got access to almost like a billion people compared to having access to 100,000 people. So that again gives you a, 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 you know, an indication of what really is happening. So what we have we seen, we have beginning to see media companies actually erecting what we call paywalls. So if you want to, 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 to read my content, you must pay or you must subscribe online. And people are refusing that. Unfortunately, people are refusing that because they are accustomed to a situation where they were consuming this content for free all along. So all of a sudden, now you want to charge it. And people would say, no. I would rather go to a, to, to a competitor who, is, who doesn't have a payroll so that I can consume that content. And that tells you about what is really happening in the media ecosystem. Because of my time, I think, let me try and escalate this thing. I wanted to talk about regulation. That is also another area where I'm seeing uh, issues. But again, we are also seeing that people are so actually saying platform companies must be regulated or they must share their advertising revenue. I think we have seen what has happened in Australia, where there is a, a, you know, a, a mandatory bargaining code that is being, being designed right now, where they are saying, at the end of the day, Facebook, Google must share their adver adver revenue with traditional media companies so that these, com these media companies can continue to exist. But because of my time, I think I'm going to jump this particular, this particular space. I think I can always talk about it, but I want to make sure that I, 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 I look at this. So the issue that probably may come to, to some of us is that, yes, we are talking about digital disruption, but how is this disruption really occurred? And I think I just want to flag at, at least two, 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 two main arguments there, and then I move on, to say that platform companies have offered new and better ways to connect buyers and sellers. So, which means, unlike what we used to do where you have to go to an advertising agency and then they book your client for you and come, now they, these platform companies like Google, like Twitter, like they have created a space where it is easier for you to connect buyers and sellers. So I can easily go to Google and still be able to, to, to see whatever I think that, you are, that is being advertised there. So it's, it's easier than actually having to buy a newspaper. I have to scroll through and see the adverts and all that kind of thing. So the platforms that they are creating are very interactive. They are also, there's also geotagging sometimes, but there's also the use of Google Maps that you can actually see the actual place that you want to book if you want to book a... So there are so many things that have happened online that which traditional newspapers can't do, unfortunately. So that also makes it very difficult for them to compete. But also we are saying these digital media technologies have provided better ways to, to, to access the non-journalism. So all of a sudden you, you, can, you can access all kinds of information, not only news on Facebook, you can access almost anything and everything there. So it's almost like a one-stop shop that has been created. So it means once you have got a one-stop shop, chances of you going to the, to, to, to the next door shop are, are limited because you are, you are glued to one platform that is really offering the service that you need at the end of the day. Uh, let me try and move with, I want to look at uh, the responses. So what has been happening? What is the media, media industry in Namibia doing to, 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 to focus and deal with some of these uh, particular issues that are, I just want to, I, 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 maybe I, some, some would probably look at me and say, uh, probably I'm being harsh, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm using uh, this particular platform to, 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 to kickstart a conversation that I think is likely to take us somewhere. But I want to say, in terms of the responses that we have seen, which are, for me are demonstrate that there's need for things to be done differently, is that while it's most newspapers or newsrooms and everything are migrating online, if you look at it closely, most of these are doing it without a well thought out digital media strategy. So there's no strategy. It's like we just want to follow what others are doing. So if you see media organizations in South Africa migrating online, you also want to migrate online. But without understanding what are your audiences in your particular context you know, requiring or what do they need so that you can actually be able to respond to that. So there's a lot of copy and pasting in terms of uh, what is actually happening. But not only that, we've also seen a lot of cost, cost, you know, cost cutting measures that I call retrenchments. We have talked about 40 journalists that have lost you know, their jobs over since 2016. Salary reductions, we have also seen the employment of interns and correspondents. I think this is a, a phenomenon that we are seeing increasingly. And this, got, this particular thing has got a huge impact in terms of the quality of journalism that is going to be produced. Because if you don't have senior qualified 
and experienced journalists, people that are likely to be running copy now are people that are just being thrown at the deep end and they don't have a complete understanding of this practice. And that ch chances are that at the end of the day, the quality of product that you're going to get may not be, and that's why I, I argue in some context that that's why we've got a lot of fake news, misinformation, disinformation now, because if you look at the structure of the newsroom and the people that are running things, you may see that there's a lot of juniorization of people in these particular spaces, and that creates a situation where errors are likely to go scot-free, people are likely not to cross-check and fact-check things before they publish them. Uh, again, the other issue that I just want to flag is that with the migration to online, what we are also seeing is a, is, is, is a phenomenon which we call in, general, in, in, in academia, journalism. And when we talk about journalism, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon where you take your offline content that you have produced in your hard copy, you take it online without customizing it to the online. And that is where the problem is, because you're just dumping offline content on your website without thinking that people that go online have got shorter attention spans and therefore they require shorter attention reads so that they can actually be able to read your content. So if you dump your content that you are taking offline and put it online, chances are that you are not, you are not, you are not responding to the platform that you are actually publishing your content, and the chances are that they are likely to be problems there. Again, I've already talked about copying and pasting of modules from the Global North, where you are pretty much seeing a lot of paywalls, subscriptions, especially if we talk about the Namibian Sun. There's a lot of harvesting of, of user data, so you have to punch in your uh, you know, email address, your phone number, so that you can access certain things. You, you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot of things that are happening in this space which require us to think about exactly. So what am I arguing? My argument is very simple. As I've already pointed out, we need unconventional thinking. And I, I think, I think we, cannot, we cannot shy away from this. We need to be very, very clear about it going forward to say, we need to think like there is no box at all. Because what we are dealing with, it has no precedence in history. Unfortunately, there's no precedence. You cannot say we, we can go and do what the, the American or the Washington Post did, or we can go and do what the New York did, because the context is different. The context is different. They are responding to American needs. We should respond to Namibian needs. We must respond to African needs. And therefore, we need to do things differently and using our own knowledge to understand what ought to happen in our own context. Now, I think, I, let me recommend, I think I'm almost done. Let me try and recommend what, what needs to happen going forward. And I think we need to make very, very, very hard and sober decisions going forward. And I therefore argue that there's need for what I call business model recalibration, which means the way in which we have designed the ways in which we, we, we get our revenue, we need to rethink that and say, how do we make sure that our, our audiences come back to our platforms and our advertisers come back to our platform? Because that is the, that is the dual problem that we have. It's about we are, we are dealing with advertisers that have run away from us. We are dealing with audiences that are also increasingly running away from us. And the way in which we need to bring this back, I think we need to rethink our business model. We need to say the way in which we were doing things somehow has been broken. We need to find ways to fix this thing that has been broken. And fixing the business model, I argue, is the first pair of call that we need to do going forward so that we can re uh, we, we can re-envision the same journalism uh, media industry that we were talking about uh, a few years ago. The other issue that I argue is that I've already, I think I've already talked about it, to say we need to think without the box. And I think creativity and innovation at this level becomes of paramount importance. Unfortunately, the current journalism curriculum that we are also even teaching as academics is sometimes not fit for purpose for this kind of industry that we are producing graduates for. And therefore, there is need for curricula, for curriculum designers and also journalism schools to think about how do we enhance entrepreneurial journalism that allows our journalists, when they go into this particular space, to think and you know, practice journalism with the ways in which they can actually do it for the good of society. Unfortunately, some of our curriculum is outdated. Some of our curriculum can no longer respond to things that are happening now. And that's why when we churn out general graduates into the newsroom, they are likely to reproduce what they, were, that what they learned in class without thinking, without the box. And I think we need curriculum that you know, help our journalists to start thinking without the box. 
I think there's, there's also there's been a curse that has also been made that we need a media relief fund. And I think I, 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 I concur with that, but I, my argument is that it should not be a permanent thing. It should be a temporary transitional mechanism to say, let's try and serve, serve and salvage media industries that have been affected by corona, for example, the COVID-19, but also affected by the economic recession that we are talking about, but also some have been disrupted by the digital technology that we are talking about. How do we serve them in the shorter, medium term so that they can find their own ways to survive beyond this kind of crisis that we are talking about? So I, I argue that it, it could happen at a very national level, it could happen at a regional level, but it, increasingly it can also happen at an international level where organizations like UNESCO and others can actually find platforms through which they can pivot this particular intervention so that we save journalism. Because at the end of the day, we are not trying to save platforms. Platforms will die, platforms will evolve, but the journalism is a, is, is a critical component of democracy. We, may, we, sh, we, we, we cannot afford to allow it to die in whatever form. It, should, it will not die and it should not die. But how do we serve it? We serve it by making sure that we make strategic decisions about where to, 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 to promote our quality and credible journalism. I also argue, in terms of my recommendations, that quality journalism ultimately will survive. Quality journalism will survive, but the distribution platforms that we are going to send out this journalism to people, unfortunately, some of it is going to evolve, and some, unfortunately, are going to die. Because that's, that's what has always happened in history, that when a new technology comes, an old technology ultimately sometimes die. So because of that, Platforms will kill each other along the way because that's the nature of, of, of innovation. That's how innovation is actually fostered in, in society. And then the other issue that I also argue in terms of going forward, I argue that we need to have what I call context-specific solutions. We need to know our audiences. We need to know our advertisers better so that we can be able to know how do we reconnect with them and we continue to have them on our platforms and continue to foster a productive and a fruitful relationship with these particular uh, stakeholders. I also argue that, of course, we may think about the Australian way, which I've already talked about, where they are already thinking about having what they call a mandatory bargaining code, where they are going to force, they have put in place a law in, in their own parliament where media companies are going, you know, platform companies like Google, Facebook, have to share the advertising revenue that is generated from that particular country with the media organizations so that they can sustain this. Yes, it's a short term, it's also a short term kind of intervention, but I think in the, in, in the shorter term, it can help us to save jobs, it can also help us to save journalism in the shorter term. But I don't think it is, it is, it is going to be a long term solution, because chances are that these platform companies are big, they can decide to say, we are no longer going to operate in your country, we decide to move out and focus on other countries that are prepared to give us unfettered access to their markets. So I think that is one thing that we really need to think about going forward. I think let me conclude. I think they, 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 there's no time for me. I, I see it's already past 10 here on my, on my watch. So I, I just want to have two minutes to conclude this. So what is it that I've been saying uh, through this particular presentation? I think what is very apparent from this particular presentation is that digital disruption is real, it is happening, and ultimately it is going to continue to affect us going forward. Unfortunately, again, COVID-19 has actually compounded the problem because it has come and made the issue of media sustainability become a critical and an important issue that we cannot shy away from. We need to focus on the elephant of the room, in the room, which is the issue of media sustainability. So for me, media sustainability is the elephant in the room, and we need to find ways in which we save journalism. Another thing that I also want to flag as I, as I conclude is that we are increasingly seeing th these precarious business models becoming unsustainable. And I think we need to find a way to fix the broken business model of journalism. And I think going forward, we need to fix the business model of journalism. It has to be fixed. We cannot, we cannot operate as if things are normal. Things are not normal. These, these are abnormal situations which require you know, serious and creative ideas so that we can deal with this. Again, the issue that I've already talked about, casualization and juniorization of newsrooms, a lot of intense correspondence being employed, this has got a knock-on effect on the quality of journalism, unfortunately. So in as much as it's, 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 it's a knee-jerk reaction to say, let's try and save our costs by employing intense 
and correspondence that we probably may not be able to pay pensions, medical cover, and all these kinds of things. It's a knee-jerk reaction, but I think going forward, it may not save our journalism. It may compound the issue of misinformation. It may compound the issue of disinformation. It may ultimately leave us no way. Even it may actually leave us in a, sp in a space where there's a lot of confusion about the content of media that we are producing. And then the other issue that I've already talked about, issues of cutting me cost cutting measures, unfortunately, that again affects the overall quality of journalism. And I think this should be one of my last uh, 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 slides here. I argue here, I think I, I argue and I argue here, that uh, perhaps after all said and done, contrary to what no, no violet, uh, for those who, li who love literature like I do, contrary to what uh, no, no, to what, uh, no violet Blawayo says, we need new names. I would argue rather that probably we need new business, we need new business model for Namibian journalism. And I think this is something that we really need to, to think about. And I think this requires not only journalists, editors, but also media owners to be on the same platform and make sure that we sustain and find ways to sustain and to save journalism. And then finally, I also argue that unfortunately, and I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm an, an eternal optimist on this one, that journalism ultimately will not die because it is the oxygen of democracy. It will continue to be there, but unfortunately, it will continue to be disrupted by digital media technologies, by pandemics like COVID-19, by economic recessions and other things. It will be disrupted, but it will still find ways of reinventing itself, adapting itself, and repackaging itself. And then finally, I think, I argue, and I continue to argue, that the future is going to be very hybrid, where we are not going to just get content through one platform like a newspaper, we're probably going to have a thousand, a million kinds of platforms that are going to come. So it's going to be a hybrid, a hybrid space where different kinds of platforms are going to come and we are going to continue to consume journalism. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your attention and I hope I have made sense uh, in things that I was trying to communicate. Thank you so much. I think the professor deserves another round of applause. So professor, I'll be the first to admit, I am totally devastated. <laughs> I am so out of my comfort zone and I am normally a person who lives outside a comfort zone. So I have been significantly challenged. Now I wonder if I have been challenged, must I take it off completely? I pre okay, let me take, yeah. If I've been challenged like this as a consequence of your discussion or your, your public lecture this morning, I would like to know and I look in the room, I can't see the people who are watching us online, but I, I'm just fascinated to think how uncomfortable they must be. We have a significant number of young people in the room. These are students who are studying in the fields of journalism. And the reason why they're studying is that they're hoping to have a career, a life, with dreams and aspirations fulfilled as a consequence of what they will do in terms of their career. And the picture is bleak. So just there, maybe, you know, I just wanted to express my discomfort with what you had to say this, just, and, but I really appreciated it. So I think we're gonna take some questions now. I'm not sure how I will be, um, how the questions will come to me from the viewers online, those of us who are watching online. But if maybe we can start with uh, first person, maybe Professor, if you can take a seat here on the high chair, and then we can just get some questions from the floor, um, and then we will proceed as a consequence uh, of this public lecture just having been delivered. Maybe I can start um, while you guys are thinking, if you're not ready to come. I'll give Professor this mic. Um, and I was wondering, and maybe I'm starting at the bottom end, Professor, because you said uh, towards the end of your discussion that uh, journalism will not die because it's the oxygen of democracy. And um, I have frequently, when I'm at the crossroads of my own 
you know, when, I, when I'm confused about where we're going as a world, when, we, when I'm confused about where we're going as a country, I frequently read uh, Plato's Republic, Plato's Republic, and I'm wondering, this democracy even, how long will it be around uh, for in the form in which it is, and maybe when that system of governance changes, maybe I'm just wondering how that will impact journalism as well, because I think the next level that is supposed to be predicted is the level of tyranny according to Plato's um, Republic. So maybe you have something to say about that. I know it's a deep question, and maybe you didn't anticipate to speak of political models, but I'm just thinking about how that political model change will change journalism as well, just like we didn't expect COVID-19. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot for that question, Yud. I think it's a, it's a very pertinent question, certainly. You are, you are very right. I think democracy in its current, you know, in its current you know, phase and model, I think actually is also, being, is also at, at crossroads in many, in many countries. And I think you have seen that uh, some actually are saying rather we don't need this kind of soft democracy. We probably need a harder democracy where you probably have some authoritarian rule uh, attached to it so that you can accomplish certain things. So when you talk about that, of course, people like Paul Kagame comes to the fore that they are pretty much almost like hardliners when you look at the way how they practice their own kind of democracy. So in a, yes, in, in, in many instances, political, political systems do evolve. But my, 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 my view of it is that in whatever form of democracy or whatever form of political system that is going to, communication and journalism we will remain the glue and an important aspect of that particular society. And I, I don't foresee a situation where we are just going to have a, a society that doesn't have journalists. I don't, I don't foresee that happening. Yes, they may not, the, the jobs that are going to be there may not be the jobs that we are training our journalists right now for. And I think that's where I think the issue of curriculum design and forward thinking mm -hmm. becomes very important because we must not train for, for, for society today, but also we must train for 10, 20 years to come. Because if we don't do that, chances are that we may be training people that are going to be redundant or people that, have to be, that are going to be disrupted by the technology that are going to come. So I think it's, 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 it's a catch-22 situation where we find ourselves. Certainly, democracy is in crisis. Journalism is also in crisis. But I think, ultimately, as I argue, journalism will not die. It may, it, it may only evolve to suit a particular system that is going to be there, mm. but in its own... In its own form and its own uh, right, it will not die as a profession. Thank you. Uh, if you could just, I think we'd need a microphone for those of you who are asking from the floor. Um, the microphone is being, you can take off. So let's just agree that when you speak on the microphone, you can decide to speak either with, a, with your mask or you can take off your mask completely. Uh, I think that seems to be the preference, um, yeah. Yes, please say your name and the Morning. institution that you represent. Uh, I'm uh, Captain JJC from Hamana student doing uh, um, journalism in media technology. Uh, my question uh, re that relates to uh, the digitalization of, 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 of uh, journalism and, and the, how journalism has evolved. Uh, yes, uh, as the journalism landscape evolves, it's true uh, throughout the centuries that we have seen from the traditional methods of how journalism has started evolving. But, but uh, as, as you have mentioned, Doctor, that uh, media houses will be followed by intense and correspondence which the media houses will, will not have to take full ownership for. Uh, now, I want to ask how should the institutions that is teaching journalism reform their curriculums to, to maybe from producing interns to experts in journalism? Yes, that's my question. Oh, okay, thanks, thanks, James, for that uh, important question that you've posed. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question that probably may may have uh, so many answers, but I think in this particular context, I just want to say, for, for us as journalism educators, I think what we often value is that we need to make sure that in as much as we put in a lot of emphasis on theory, we need to make sure that we also infuse an equal dose of practical skills. Because theory on its own may not be able to, to capacitate our journalists 
to be what we want them to be. And I think there is need actually going forward to emphasize the need of actually having so many soft skills so that you can be able to even do your own journalism. You can actually be a media house on your own without really relying on somebody to employ you. And I think those soft skills are what we, I think we should pretty much be focusing on because as I've already pointed out, the advent of these technologies have actually democratized this communication space, which means there are low barriers of entry. You can easily get in and run your own media company as long as you have got quality content and content that can actually attract advertisers and audiences. So you don't really need a media institution per se to survive. You can be a media, your, your own media institution, but you can only do that when you have been capacitated through the relevant kind of curriculum that speaks to the age in which we find ourselves. But unfortunately, as we have already pointed out, our curricula is in, also as, as educators, or even as media, as, as uh, uh, universities, are pretty much sometimes lagging behind because most of the time we take time before we, we, we do what we call a curriculum review. By the time we do a curriculum review, so many things would have happened, especially in the technology space, which means we are always in the catch, we are trying to catch up. We, 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 we are always trying to catch up. And I think it then means that at an individual level as a lecturer, it's, uh, it's important as part of the so-called 20 percent where you have got 20 percent uh, you know, likelihood that you can actually imp input whatever you think is important to the curriculum, that you think about those things that you think are important at that time so that you can always be ahead of the game. That's what I would say. Thank you so much. Well, um, okay, well, you have a follow-up question. Can I just, before you ask that question, Shireen, just ask you, um, thinking about, you, you spoke about curriculum design, you spoke just now about interns, um, you spoke about, um, you know, the overemphasis sometimes on theory, and therefore I think the market sort of created this need for interns, you know, because there's, so li there's such limited exposure in terms of the practice. Um, and therefore, these interns became a feature, you know, for between um, in an academic institution and finding a job, per se. Um, then you also talked about the circuit of culture. I was very interested when you talked about that. And you talked a little bit about regulation. And I just want to just, you know, before we go back to the audience again, just if you can maybe talk about regulation as a component of that circuit of culture, um, what would you tell a regulator watching this program right now? What are the, because like you say, we're forever playing catch up. We don't want to play catch up because we will always lose out. How do we educate our legislators so that they stay ahead of this times? Thank, thank you so much for that question. I, I, I always argue that when you are regulating at the level of platforms or even technology, you need to adopt what we call technology neutral uh, type of legislation. Mm -hmm. that, ty that type of legislation, may, it, 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 it's, it, it's going to be a situation where you just don't re regulate because you are focusing on a particular common, let's say you are focusing on Facebook, because you don't know two years down the line Facebook can fold. Mm -hmm. So you must think about how do I regulate companies that are in this technological space in ways that does not stifle their, their, their innovation, but also that does not also promote in discipline on their platform. So that's what we call uh, you know, technology neutral kind of you know, legislation. And I think there are, there are so many good models in Europe, for example, you know, the GDPR of course may, it may have its own uh, problems when you look at it, but it, it attempts to, to use, to infuse what we call technological neutral type of regulation that are required at this type of level so that you allow local in, in entrepreneurs that want to start their own apps or platform companies here in Namibia they can also thrive in that particular space. But if you regulate so that you, you kill innovation, chances are that you are not also going to promote uh, you know, innovation and also uh, you know, you know, creativity in that particular market. That's what I would say. But just to maybe to, to respond to again to the issue of the intents that you were talking about. Yes, it's, it's the market that uh, allowed us to get to where we are. Yeah. But when it becomes a culture, where you pretty much get into a newsroom and you find it's almost like it's a newsroom of 20 people and you find the newsroom has got almost like 15, 15 interns or correspondents. It tells you a lot. It yeah. tells you a lot about it's, a, it's about cost, cost cutting at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. And if it's about cost cutting, what is the implications on the quality of journalism at the end of the day? Because ultimately it affects the, the, the overall product that you are trying to create. Thank you. I hear you're on the creating of the culture. Yeah. Shireen? Um, doctor, you, you mentioned that, um, that the media is a critical component of democracy. Okay. So um, with the emergence of citizen journalism, uh, would you say that digitalization 
has diluted the role of the media as the fourth estate? Th thank you so much for that question. I think it's, it's a very important question, one again. Certainly, I think one thing that I also flagged when I was presenting was that if you go in, in history, there's always this adage or there's this saying that says journalism is the first rough draft of history. Unfortunately, journalists are no longer the first rough, rough drafters of history. There are so many people that are also in that particular space. Citizen journalists being one, bloggers. Now we have got so what we call social media influencers. This, these have actually gone even a step further. Mm -hmm. They have taken on with them a lot of audiences. There are so many people who are so glued on these social media influencers to the point that they don't even, you, you can actually find a social media influencer who has got more, more followers than a, a traditional media uh, company. Mm -hmm. And it tells you a lot. Even a, a social media influencer has got more followers than a president in a country. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that. And it's a new phenomenon. It tells you about the fleeting nature of the digital media space. It tells you a lot about that we, we, we are no longer the only ones that have got the we are no longer the priests of the truth, if you want to use that particular statement in, 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 any, in any regard. We are no longer the only priests that are going to be speaking about the truth in society. And because of that, it means the context in which we find ourselves is a, is a totally different kind of context where the media is the fourth state. Must understand that they are also coexisting with what some scholars call the fifth state, which is made up of citizen, citizen journalists, bloggers, social media influencers, and the like. That's what I would argue. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any online participation? Uh, do we have a question from an online community? Is there a way in which you can just see? Then we'll come to you, sir. I just want to give them a moment. OK, good. Thank you for those of you who are still joined uh, by watching us in live stream. Um, we've just had Dr. Murray spoken. Uh, we've just had him speak um, on disruption. Very uncomfortable discussion for a lot of us in the room. So lots of questions um, and answers being, of, you know, at the stage being offered to us. I have a gentleman towards the back. He has a question. If you could ask your question, introduce yourself though first, please. Um, thank you very much. My name is Romeo. I'm a nurse student. And the question that I have is, for, for a journalist that does not have journalism credentials, but then they, put, they broadcast, new, uh, what is it, journalism content. Mm. The question is, how would you advise the one that's busy screening that to have a thorough mental regulation of if this content is right or wrong, like if the information that's being posted is right or wrong. Okay, Th thanks, thanks a lot for, for that question. I think that question ties in, I think, with what uh, the next panel is, is pretty much yeah. going to be talking about, the media ethics in the digital age. That in, in this kind of context, where pretty people that we probably may not in, in conventional parlance or in conventional ways call journalists, all of a sudden when these people are now broadcasting or they are producing content, how do they know what is newsworthy, what is ethical, what is professional to produce in the first place? And how, do they, how, do, how, how should they be capacitated to make sure that they are producing content that is ethical? And I think we have seen what has been happening of late, that when people just get into, you know, instead of helping somebody who has been involved in an accident, the first thing people often do is to take, take, take photos, upload them online or share on mm -hmm. WhatsApp before even telling the next of kin. And we are seeing that quite a lot. Yeah. It tells you a lot about the context in which we have. So we are, so we are a generation that is so interested in breaking the news mm -hmm. without doing the basics in terms of verifying the information and paying due diligence in terms of thinking about the repercussions of what we are doing. We also saw the same thing. If you look at, remember that uh, Facebook Live, uh, situation in New Zealand where this guy was mm -hmm. killing people in a church and taking a Facebook live, you know, and people were literally seeing this happening. And it tells you a lot about the, the culture in which we are in the age and the culture in which we find ourselves. And that demonstrates to you that I think going forward, I think so digital literacy or digital literacy, no media literacy per se, should be an issue that is part and parcel of our education curriculum as we are young people. Because pretty much even as young people are content creators too. 
So we need media literacy that cuts across the whole educational spectrum. It starts when you are very young so that you know the rights and responsibilities that you have as a content, pro a content producer. Because at one point in time, you're going to produce content. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of things that are happening that, that, that are also very problematic. For example, what some scholars are actually call it, calling share renting, where you, 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 begin, you, you actually put your, your kid on Facebook before she, she's even born. Mm -hmm. So pretty much when you share your, your, your pictures about your pregnancy, the pe there's no consent about, the person who is inside you is not consented to that, mm -hmm. you see. So you are, do, you, are, you are sharing things without the consent of your child. And I think this is already ra raising regulatory issues in other co contexts where people are saying, but where are you getting the consent of this particular person? Because this person also has got consent issues. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a lot of issues that are being created and I think we need to think about them crit critically before we just post. So that's why nowadays people say, we are recording, uh, if anybody who is not uh, interested in being, uh, can they say, I'm not going to be part of this recording? Because it's about consent issues and increasingly online consent issues are becoming very, very more important and we think we need to make sure that consent issues are addressed because if we don't do that, we may have a law cases, lawsuits being uh, uh, thrown at us because we violated uh, people's privacy and also confidentiality, which is also a very important uh, uh, constitutional right in, in, in many, in many, in many co contexts. Thank you so much. We have four minutes left of this discussion and then we must go into the next segment. Um, any final burning questions from the audience in the room? And then we must conclude. Yes, can we have the microphone just here in front? And then doctor, I'll ask you just to begin to prepare your concluding, concluding remarks as we um, shut down this conversation in about two minutes or so from now. Uh, as we are talking about um, how uh, we get news, uh, when it comes to uh, journalism, uh, students may or majors versus uh, the citizen journalist. And if we look at, at the regulation, I think that uh, uh, my question is that should uh, the, the, the regulatory authorities also not look into the to the to the matter of the citizen journalists because uh, sometimes. It's, 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 a, it's a challenge for the, for, the, for the mainstream journalists who should have facts and speak truth to power. Because these people will just put out content there. But if you as a journalist put out content there, the fact checkers will check your, 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 your story and, 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 and all, all the other issues that is coming afterwards, the consequences, let me say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will follow the mainstream journalists, but not the, 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 yeah. the citizen journalists. The citizen journalists mm -hmm. now, now sh should, should the regulatory authorities uh, maybe bring up a law to, to fact check these citizen journalists to, to, to make sure that, that the journalism profession is kept at, at, its, at its core for bringing uh, 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 for bringing uh, credible content to online platforms also uh, and also through uh, the digital uh, play, uh, uh, or through the traditional platforms of giving information. Okay, thanks, thanks James for that question. Uh, it's, it's a very important question but what I just want to say is that uh, luckily in this particular context where we find ourselves in this country we use a self-regulatory mechanism, mm. which means that if we want to bring again on board uh, citizen journalists and other online content creators, I think we need to revise our Namibian media code of conduct and code of ethics for media practitioners so that it is broader and allows us to, catch, to cater for these other diverse groups that are coming. But again, that also raises a, a, a serious issue because I know in other contexts, I know for example, in Zimbabwe right now, this what is why they are calling the Media Practitioners Bill, and that bill has actually ignited a lot of discussion amongst amongst people because all of a sudden that bill is trying to demarcate who is a journalist and who is not. Hmm. And I, again, those who are in the online content crea creation space are actually saying no, this particular thing is going to create a situation where we are going to be 
pushed out of the profession or pushed out of this content production. And I think it, it becomes a, a difficult issue, but I think it's an issue that I think going forward, maybe even Namibia may find itself getting into that space where pretty much you have to come up with a regulation to say who is a journalist and who is not. Where do we draw the line? And again, given that the technology has made it very easy for almost everyone to become a content producer, Write, uh, writing that line on, on send, uh, it, because it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be an easy thing. Because at the end of the day, all of us are content creators. When I post something on Facebook, I'm already con co co contributing. I'm also producing content. When I do live streams, I'm also doing journalism, pretty much, or I'm doing content production. So again, that creates a situation where you, when you ask yourself, you see that at the end of the day, journalism has changed. And I think... Probably, I, I think we, we need to find saving grace in this self-regulatory mechanism where maybe at the level of the code of conduct, that's where probably we may, may be able to deal with some of these issues that are you know, problematic that we are talking about. But it's not going to be easy. That's what I, what I would say. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just thinking as I'm standing here, because we don't think about things, I think before the time we obviously learn as we go. Maybe the you know, selecting the word social media. Maybe we shouldn't have called it social media <laughs> because the component of media legitimized it and made True. it formal, True. you know, and made it accessible to all of us. So now whatever, like my unborn child, who I have a photograph of myself on, is, you know, being marketed on social media. Just that media, you know, the use of that word True. in that context just gave a different dimension to it, but mm. I guess we are here where we are right now and we can't go back. True, true. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're concluding, um, and I think really, uh, Doc, we had an excellent, excellent experience with you. I thoroughly appreciated this and I thoroughly engaged. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd definitely like to get a copy of your lecture, I'm sure, as most of the people in the room, but you've registered, so it should be able, Josepha, to have an email to them. Okay, very good. So it will be emailed to you once you've given and signed in the registration, uh, the register over there. But thank you very much. I've learned a lot. I think uh, I've been challenged a lot this morning and I will definitely look for an opportunity to get, engage you again in the near future. So ladies and gentlemen, please let us appreciate him. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break mm -hmm. for tea. Uh, those of you who are watching us online, we're having a quick tea break for about 15 minutes and then we'll be back, approximately. Yeah. Thank you for having joined us. This is obviously our second session for the morning, so welcome back to everybody. We just had tea. Uh, welcome back also to our online audience. We're now going to go straight into a panel discussion, um, and I'd like to introduce our speakers. Maybe just so you know, to occupy the seats to my right, uh, the speakers, so as I call you up, just uh, if you would just take your position, your position, there's also a microphone for you on your chair. Uh, it is sanitized properly, and just so that you know, uh, you can choose to have your mic, oh, sorry, your mask on completely, or you can remove it completely, so you don't do the same thing that I'm doing. So let me just do justice to this and just remove it right now, because I've kind of done it both ways uh, at different times. So um, uh, panel discussion this morning on media ethics in a digitalized world. We had a very good session just now with uh, Dr. Mare, and I think we were thoroughly challenged, uh, all of us in the room, and I think those of the people also, we had some good comments from people watching online. Um, we are streaming live with Informante, and we're hoping to cover a significant number of those who are watching, um, or at least who normally watch the Informante live streaming. Um, but special thank you to those of you who took the time to come to the room. Obviously, this is the new reality. They say, what do they say, the new normal, where things are hybrid, there is a live component to it. And I always wonder when people say there's a live component to it, what's the virtual component? Is that the dead component? Um, but <laughs> this is the live physical component to it. Um, so, yeah. Let me just welcome, first and foremost, then uh, our very distinguished panel. We are truly honored to have you this morning. Um, so let me introduce to you Gwen Lister first. I think I've known Gwen the longest in this room. Nobody can beat me in that regard. 
I'd like to have history on my side, you know. <laughs> so, Gwen, please come and take up your seat. Um, no, you can just, I think anyone is, is good. Yeah. Um, so, I guess if you ask me, and I think if, uh, it, if anybody was to ask you who Gwen Lister is, she is obviously an icon, literally, uh, of the Namibian media in this country, have paid a personal price, uh, not only for where the country, you know, for the country's liberation, but also for where press freedom is and continue. You know, she continues to make a contribution um, to a free Namibia and especially in regards to press freedom. I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday afternoon about you, Gwen. So, and it's interesting, we talked about, you know, uh, when is she writing a book? When are we going to hear a little bit more about her in a concrete form? And just now when Gwen and I had a conversation, she informed me that there's a book coming and it will be launched in June, hopefully. She'll tell us a bit more about it, but I'm really, really thrilled that you you are there to give us um, that book because Namibia's history would not be complete without you writing a book. Um, my staff actually did... So this is Gwen Lister, guys. Mm -hmm. My staff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we did, a, we, did a, we did some work, I think, about two weeks ago for a client. Um, and interestingly enough, you came up in that uh, survey as well. So excellent to have you here. Veteran journalist, chairperson of the Namibia Media Trust and uh, the co-chair um, of the original um, Ventuk Declaration Conference, which at that time was called the UNESCO African Editors Conference, and that would eventually led to the Ventuk Declaration in 1991. Then I'd like to introduce to you our next um, um, speaker or panelist. Um, that is Tiri Masawi. I don't want to say his whole name, his complete name, because maybe I'll, I'll, I'll destroy it. So Thierry is a freelance journalist, vast expertise in Namibia. I said to him this morning when I saw him, he looks like a rock star, and then somebody said, he is DMX reincarnated. And it's very relevant because DMX's family got a lot of money from Kanye West yesterday. So I think you want to be a member of that family right now. So Thierry, welcome, and thank you for being here with us this morning. Mr. Masawi has worked um, with quite a number of the entities, uh, Namibians, um, specifically the Southern Times, that was your last engagement, right? But really years of experience in Namibia. Then I'm going to introduce to you um, Professor or Dr. Clayton Peel. Good morning. He has been here with us since early this morning, right at the beginning he's been with us. A PhD holder in diaspora and communication and a senior lecturer also at NAST. I'm thrilled with the participation of NAST uh, here this morning. Um, so, and I see some, are you a st former student, Shemaine? You were about to clap hands for him. Shemaine, go for it, clap hands for your lecturer. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Peel as he um, joins us here this morning for this panel discussion on media ethics in a digitalized world. Finally, uh, I am privileged to introduce uh, Matthias Haufiku. I really need to, to discipline myself to stick to what is written in front of me. Um, I know this guy very well. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, the news editor for the Namibian Sun, an investigative journalist of note. We've been to court together. We have won court cases together. <laughs> And so, yeah, we've done quite a few things in this country. So, honored to have you here, Matthias, this morning. Thank you for joining. I didn't introduce myself in the first segment. Um, it's always funny. I don't know when I introduce myself, whether I should introduce myself. But I think it's just proper and it's good manners that I introduce myself. My name is Hilda Besson Amonjebo, and my job is simply to moderate discussions. And thank you, Nashilongo, for having me here this morning, who's our organizer. So let's start this conversation, and I don't want to pretend this morning um, to our panelists that I know anything about media ethics, because I think it's such a necessary discussion, we almost need to start from scratch, because as it is evident, it is crazy out there. So who wants to start by telling maybe us this morning what, what for you constitute media ethics, even outside of the digital space? Just what, what do you think is media and what should it look like? What should it be like? Let's start there. 
Gwen? It's on? Yeah, Good. it's on. Thank you. Um, Hilda, big question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What is ethics? What is media ethics? Mm -hmm. I don't see that there's terribly much difference between the two. Um, and I'll tell you why. I mean, what is ethics really? It's a moral code mm -hmm. of some kind or a set of principles that one applies to life. And I think most of us know when we grow up as children, we learn ethics. In one way or another, our parents tell us, don't hit your brother, mm -hmm. don't steal from my purse, whatever it may be, we're learning issues of right and wrong. And I think ethics basically comes down to that. Although I must add, there are ethics that are sort of absolute yeah. um, in the journalistic sense. I mean, those ethics would include, you should not plagiarize, I don't think anybody's going to say they're gray areas in that regard. It's simply not done to plagiarize someone else's work. And they're also what we might call situational ethics, yeah. um, which um, may change from time to time and a lot of gray areas. So for, for journalists, it's possibly a lot more complex than it is for ordinary individuals to make that choice as to what is ethical and what is not. Um, in saying that, I must obviously reference our um, editors' forum online, a code of ethics for both uh, print, broadcast, and online media. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer to everything, but it does provide certain guidelines for journalists working in the field. Mm -hmm. And obviously, any journalist starting out, the first thing they need to learn is what are the ethics of any given situation. Um, again, I think the problem comes with the gray areas. But let's maybe take that from the journalist to the new digital world that we live in today. Once upon a time, certainly in my era, uh, journalists were the be-all and end-all. Yeah. They were the ones who had the access, whether it was to a newspaper or a radio, usually the traditional or legacy media. Then came the internet and of course the social media tsunami, as I may call it, which brought with it a lot of amazing things. It seemed to democratize the media space on the one hand, and it gave rise to things like the Arab Spring mm -hmm. and so on online. Um, but on the other hand, it brought us a horrible space filled with clickbait and disinformation and misinformation and falsehoods and hate speech and all kinds of things. So this is the terrain that we now have to navigate Generally speaking, and I know Matthias and other journalists will agree with me, in the journalistic sense, they are always the gatekeepers. Mm. If you as a journalist write a story, it generally goes through a sub-editor, it probably even goes through the news editor, and it may even come to the attention of the editor. So yeah. many sets yeah. of eyes look at that story before it goes to print, with, particularly with, with reference to ethics. But in the new world, all citizens or most citizens who have access online are themselves now, they're not journalists, but yeah. they're certainly media and they're yeah. playing in the media environment. And that kind of uh, checks and balances, one might call it, are not there before they put something blatantly out fake yeah. out on WhatsApp. So my big dilemma is how do we get this code of ethics, which is largely applied to journalists, to apply to the entire media space online. And I think that would help us mm. cope with some of these major problems like disinformation and so on. I'll rest there for the moment. Very good. So that being the case, we have a good understanding then of what ethics, what it's constitute. I'd like to come to you, Dr. Peel, specifically and ask you, how is it different? Is there, is there something that Gwen has not mentioned where it is different in the digital space in terms re in regards, um, you know, the experience uh, between what it is in print and what it is then or in press and what it is then in the di digital space. Is there a substantial difference that was not mentioned yet? Uh, yes. I think it should be on. Just keep everybody's mic on, please. Just got to put it close to your mouth, I think. Yeah. Oh, I think you switched it off, yeah. Okay, good. One, two, one, two, one, two, yeah. two. Okay. More volume. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, in my view, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. um, we are dealing in a new environment which was intended to 
democratize the information systems. I mean, people who contributed to uh, the very World Wide Web itself, mm. uh, people like Tim Berners-Lee, who is still alive, actually wanted to generate something that encouraged the free flow of information with as minimum barriers as possible. So by its nature, by its origin, it's going to be different. Uh, however, uh, the unfortunate thing to that is, therefore, the very positive side to the practice of information dissemination, which includes journalism, uh, and that is having standards, uh, standards which have to be learned. It's not a kind of, uh, you know, we'll see as we go kind of thing, because you're dealing with information as a commodity which influences people's lives. Uh, and that becomes then a victim of this, uh, you know, as we go kind of uh, culture. And, and therefore, uh, I think what is absent, one of the things that is absent is one, the learning, mm. learning of standards. You know, why, why should I learn when I can simply, you know, take a snap or film it and put it on my platform? Learn what? What mm. do I need to learn? And, and therefore, we now have this demarcation between an appreciation of ethics in conventional media and what is actually practiced in the information dissemination um, in the new media. I like the distinction that you drew when you said uh, journalism. You had a very distinct reference to journalism and then you had a distinct reference to it being as if it were different from information um, and the manner in which it influences people. I just want to hear just your final thoughts because I'm wondering if that's not what produced all, this, all of this gray area that everybody now whether you produce information you're seen as a journalist, and what does journalism really mean? And how is it experienced? Is that not maybe where some of the, our problems originate from? Yeah, it, it could well be. I mean, journalism, and, and maybe I'm going to sound more conservative than I really am. Uh, journalism is a vocation. A vocation which, among other things, wants to be part of not just telling a story, but telling the true story. Mm -hmm. um, so it is information, uh, but extra steps are taken. Uh, there's mention of gatekeepers mm -hmm. uh, to, to ensure that that story is actually as factual as possible, and even where there is room for opinions, that those opinions are informed opinions. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, broader information can be information which is intended to entertain, and if my intention is to entertain, uh, factual content may not be as important. Yeah. So um, I actually didn't intentionally make that distinction, but I think it is there. Yeah, yeah. good. Tiri, if I can come to you, uh, maybe because the first component, we really want to be as educational as, as possible because we understand there are huge gaps in this conversation. We have an assumption that we all understand what ethics are, um, but we have such different views as you know, and how, in the manner in which they play out on a daily basis. So can you maybe talk about the platforms where, from your perspective, where is this abuse or misunderstanding of ethics? Where is it more visible? Where, did, where are you concerned about when you, what, what is it that makes you concerned when you watch it? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Yoda. Um, I think I would concur with uh, earlier what uh, Gwen said. Um, for me, I believe, of course, ethics are pretty much nothing but a normative code of conduct that has become um, acceptable. And uh, in, 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 in journalism, I think it's even um, challenging now to speak of ethics, especially now in the digital age or in the advent of um, social media. I, I seem to believe that uh, the advent of social media or the dominance of social media has been both a case and, uh, and a blessing, I think, in the development of, 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 of journalism. My, I, see, I think I see the biggest challenge in terms of uh, upholding ethics, um, mostly in the usual social media, your Facebooks, your, your, your Twitter. It is really come at a time maybe it has helped a lot of newsrooms be able to you know, reach bigger audiences, be able to disseminate information very fast, and also be able to capture um, different audiences. And um, unfortunately, on the flip side, um, it has also created room for the so-called citizen um, journalists and uh, also other people that uh, just want to peddle certain information that they want uh, on, 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 on social media. So pretty much there, that's where the control of, of, of whatever goes out um, is, is, is lost. 
Sometimes within uh, us, journalists as always, as, as we practice, you tend to notice that because of that push with, with, with social media, that push to be able to break a story in the shortest possible mm -hmm. time, get information to reach out uh, uh, as soon as possible to beat uh, the next uh, person, sometimes facts might be, uh, might be compromised. I think that that is on the conventional journalism uh, part. Mm. But what is even more challenging is now I think if you go randomly on, 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 on Facebook, you see that it's, it's no longer a, a, a weird thing for someone to just take a picture of, of, of an accident where their dead bodies, post them on social media. The, the, the age of everyone wanting to take advantage of that space that is there to communicate your sort of overridden um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the belief or the, the, the push for people to abide by certain um, uh, codes. And these mostly come from citizen journalists and these people that also just want to, you know, there's been this avenue that social media brought where everyone feels like their voice um, has to be heard uh, somewhere, somehow. But where that this voice being heard comes with control of what else goes, whatever goes out there yeah. is something else. Yeah. So I think that's where we have a, a very big uh, challenge to try to strike a balance between conventional um, uh, media or the normal journalists that yeah. are trained, that have the training to, to do this putting out information that is correct, that is accurate, and also that protects other people's um, privacy as well. And the so-called um, uh, 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 citizen journalists trying to also play a part in, 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 in that space by doing it in an acceptable uh, uh, way that doesn't infringe on other, on, on other people as well. Matthias, why do you think this conversation is important? Why do you think the ethics component, for a journalist, I mean, yes, we have various other careers uh, where, for example, lawyers, they sign, obviously, certain commitments to uphold justice. Um, and same with doctors, um, with journalists, yes, we don't quite sign a code of conduct uh, upon taking up employment. But why is this conversation, or why is, the, why is ethics important in that relationship between somebody who receives news, receives information, and the person who provides that information. Yeah, thank you, Hilda. Firstly, I think it's important that we take note of the evolution that has taken place in the space in which we operate. I'm not quite sure we are moving as fast enough mm -hmm. as the changes happen. Um, the ethics conversation is key in the sense that you'll see that there are a set of unwritten rules but as practitioners, we know what, what to uphold. Um, so you'll see that you mentioned now lawyers have mm -hmm. a code that they adhere to and so on. Um, one would then ask, um, with the changes going on in the digital space and so on, will we get to a stage where journalists, before you start practicing, where we have a sort of a, like an engineering council, like a media council that vets? Um, because now you'll see that the, the, the aspect of reporting is, that is slowly but surely taking a back seat, and you have to dig deeper now. And as much as we say that there's a lot of fake news going around on the internet, there's a lot of tips on the internet. That's, what, that's how I see That's my yeah. school of thought. Mm -hmm. Because there are spaces in which we are not as journalists. I mean, there's some areas which we don't cover. So if person A from a village deep down in the south, there's no media coverage, uh, posts something on, 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 on Facebook, for instance, Surely there's a, for the person who posts that, there's a relativity of truth in that. Yeah. So do we then just ignore it because it's a citizen journalist who posted it? What do we then do to take that conversation further in terms of digging? It's the same as when we write stories. We feel that, okay, the story I put out now, I feel the story is solid. Mm -hmm. But when someone who knows the subject matter calls you and says, no, you missed this angle, this is actually the story. So it's really relative to who disseminates the news. You are not always, there's not... It's not right in totality. We always try as much to get as close to, as possible to the real story that's there. So you'll see that the ethics element and the law element, media law, media ethics. Mm -hmm. When it comes to law, it's just a set rules. You have to abide whether you like it or not. You have the issue of national security, um, the, the Protection of Information Act, mm -hmm. the NCI Act, and so on. You know that's a no-go area. Mm -hmm. But for ethics, there are areas you, you can enter into, but your moral, you, have, you have that moral obligation also to uphold. Yeah. To say, okay, there's this story, mm. but if I push it out, what good does it serve? Mm. As much as it's the truth, there's an eth ethical consideration that you always have to uphold also. So that's why I think social media has to a certain extent 
come to aid us in the industry. It's not per se a challenge. Mm. We, we, we need to harness its presence and just find a way to coexist with it. We can't, we can't want to be the owners of information. Yeah. That, that era is gone. Where, yeah, that, I have, where I know if I'm not uh, sitting in front of the TV at 8, yeah. the news is gone. Yeah. It's, it's, people decide now what they want to know. It's not up to us to tell them what we feel they should know anymore. Mm. So how do we then move uh, uh, together with that evolution? Mm. Um, you also see that in our space, there, there has been over the years, and it, and it, it really worried me um, that we, we have, to a certain extent, developed that approach that uh, we are beyond reproach. The slight, slightest of criticism, and we want to jump to the media freedom, media freedom is being mm. trampled upon. Um, but we forget the space in which we operate. It's, yeah. it's a robust space. Um, there's interest, there's resources at play. So we also need to consider that when we do our work. Mm. Um, but with social media, you see even the bashing that goes on there. Um, see, those, the Facebook journalists don't care about ethics. They can bash you, they can bash your mother or your family. And that's exactly where yeah. I want us to have this conversation. So it's true, they don't care about ethics, they don't care about who they... Tiri spoke about... Uh, photographs being taken of um, somebody here on Facebook or social media that a loved one has passed away, whereas a journal in the traditional conventional journalism that would never happen. How do we how do we take then the values that we uphold in the conventional media space? How do we take those values to the social or digital space, Gwen um, or Doctor? Any of the two of you can answer, because we must bridge that, because. A lot of people's lives are being destroyed. We lose the trust, um, you know, as um, people who bring information to people. We clearly have a responsibility to educate that segment also that there is an ethical responsibility on them. Gwen, do you want to go for it? Yeah, just a few, maybe first to agree with Matthias that, you know, this space for journalism is forever changed yeah. um, because of the digital era. Um, so that goes without saying. At the same time, to, to sort of add on to what you've just asked, to what extent is it a journalist's responsibility to help mm -hmm. perhaps a, a, a very unsophisticated audience in some cases understand the difference between what is sensational, what is fake, and what is real news that they can use to make a difference in their lives? I think this is the dilemma that we face now, especially with the survival of good journalism at stake. Um, how do we, and what is journalists' role as verifier or, or verification of a lot of the stuff on Facebook? I agree again with Matthias. There's a lot of raw material for journalists to find in social media and on the internet to write stories about and to do proper mm -hmm. investigations, certainly, and hints and tips it's almost like our sources are now yeah. online yeah. where we used to have to find them in person. But at the same time, to what extent do we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to help verify and to point out to people this is an untruth, mm -hmm. this is a lie. In other words, what is our part in media literacy? Making people aware of the, the, the pitfalls on the internet. Because to a very large extent, um, I think there's a clash of values happening here as well. We have the right to free expression, and we're yeah. all very aware yeah. of that. We also have the right to free speech and press freedom. But those values always have to interact with other values, yeah. such as the right to privacy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and those are things journalists are very conscious of. But there's not that same consciousness among people who are simply posting on the internet as to how far your rights end yeah. where mine begin or vice versa. Yeah. So I think, yeah, those few thoughts. Doctor? Uh, thanks, uh, Yilda. I, I think we need to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Look, we used to belong to a profession where we produced information that was taken as a matter of record. Uh, you would say uh, the capital city of Cameroon is Yaoundé mm -hmm. because you saw it in the Namibian or you heard a newscaster mention it on NBC. Yeah. It was researched, it was checked, it was fact, and if an error was made, mm -hmm. 
the minute it was pointed out, the next news bulletin, the next publication would correct it because yes. we used to be part of producing a matter of record. Now the space is contested. Now, tragically, even professional journalists, when they are in their own virtual spaces, don't bother to, to, to check. They'll simply retweet the first thing that comes in. <gasps> so and so has died. Who? And they are the very ones who are perpetuating it without checking, and often it is untrue. Uh, let me just demonstrate this. Uh, about some time last year, the president of Zimbabwe appointed somebody as a, uh, a, a, an honorary consul in Israel. Mm. Right? An honorary consul is, any, you could pick anybody. Uh, you could pick a Namibian in Namibia if you yeah. don't want to have an embassy mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to represent that country. Mm -hmm. So he appointed somebody who is a businessman in Israel as honorary consul. And the headline said, Mnangagwa appoints foreigner as Zimbabwe's ambassador to Israel. <laughs> wow, that's, that's something. When in fact, it was an honorary consul. And actually, the very story said that. So I tried to responsibly respond and explain what that difference was. And the kind of feedback I got was, oh, you must be an Israeli spy. Now, that is, this, this is a publication which bears the name of my city of birth, right? Nobody made any attempt to correct it. The editors, none of them. When I raised it in class, I don't know if it was a media ethics class, and I said, okay, guys, Google the story. Do you know that story came up in publications in Bangladesh, mm. Sri Lanka, mm. Italy? The same story. And it has never been corrected up to now. Never. So what I'm saying is this, this challenge of matters of record, we've already heard in previous uh, uh, Professor Murray's presentation that increasingly the younger generation are preferring these online sources. It mm. becomes a point of reference. Mm. And so I just think that gap has to be narrowed. So we have to go back then to objectivity, which is a fundamental principle in terms of journalism. Mm. And again, um, with doctors, a doctor cannot treat their own family member. Lawyers also have to have a level of distance from clients and, and, and that kind of environment. And I'm wondering about the relationship a journalist almost has to have with him or herself to be able to stand away from my story so that I can be sure that I meet the standards of ethics. How do we help our journalists? to achieve that, because we seem to be struggling with that, because we are all into sensationalist headlines. It is a fact in Namibia that that is on the increase, um, and a lot of these things are just going unchecked. We have those documents. This is the great thing about Namibia, not only in the political space, Gwen, that we have fantastic legislation in this country, just implementation is a little bit challenging. Is it not the same with journalists, that we have the media ombudsman, we have the Editors Forum of Namibia Codes of Conduct. However, we see those gaps between that, do, those documents existing, but the lived experience is, is very different. So Tiri helped me to help the journalist in Namibia understand that relationship that they must have to query and interrogate their own stories. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Yoda. It's also one very topical issue of objectivity and subjectivity uh, sometimes. But I think uh, there's the old belief that um, a good story laid down in, a sim in the simplest possible way, we always sell. You don't necessarily have to go the extra mile to aid things or to be sensational to be able to, to sell a story. I think that is the basic uh, tenet that every other journalist practicing should be able to, to believe in. If you do your story in the simplest possible uh, uh, way, get the facts right, get your, uh, your, 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 your story checked properly, go tick all the boxes, it's perfect enough to convey um, uh, um, uh, the, that message. Sometimes when you see yourself getting the push to want to move boundaries or to sensationalize, maybe it still comes back to you as a journalist whether you have done enough uh, research to be able to have a solid story that, that can just sell as it is without you having to, to do the, the most. But unfortunately in the, in, in, in the era where we are, we, we are living in, 
it, it, it's a very competitive um, industry mm -hmm. that, that, that we are in. I mean, you have a multiplicity of, of, of voices in Namibia, so many uh, newspapers. So there's always been that edge to want to beat uh, the next uh, journalist, the next newspaper. I think that's where we have had the bigger problem when sometimes a very, very good story that could actually have impacted um, um, lives is completely lost. In, 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 in the zoo of wanting to sensationalize, thereby selling more or reaching uh, a, 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 a bit more people yeah. than what you were just uh, supposed to do, stick to the, to the basics, write your story, get uh, the, 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 the public uh, to judge. What is even more um, terrible uh, right now, especially with, uh, with, 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 uh, with social media, you see, as journalists also, we have also somehow jumped into this um, bandwagon where we sometimes put very sensational uh, material as well uh, on, 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 on social media without really um, caring how it's going to affect um, the next person. But ideally, we are supposed to be the people that are supposed to you know, narrow this uh, sensationalism or narrow this um, yeah. uh, uh, fake uh, or sensational news going out. But unfortunately, we are also playing into, in, into, into that space. So I think my biggest belief uh, is that um, if you really are a, a, a good journalist, whether young, you're starting, or you're experienced, sometimes the basics always do it best. I mean, stick to the basics, uh, speak to your sources, verify your, uh, your, your, your facts, get your story uh, subbed, just, just run as, uh, as, as it is. If you then jump uh, that in the, in, in, in the race that, okay, I have to maybe hit front page, um, of course, you've gotten on the, on the front page, the story everyone is, is talking about, but you yourself, you have a moral obligation of communicating the relevant and the mm. correct um, uh, in, 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 in information. So that, that, that's where we need to, 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 to be smart. Let's stick to the basics. We don't necessarily have to push the, the boundaries to be able to, to do a better story. Matthias, do you have a comment to that? Yeah, um, the objectivity and subjectivity topic is, is really one that uh, we never really come to a, a conclusion as to what is, uh, what is really the right way to go about it. Um, naturally, you may, inherently, as humans, we are conflicted towards matters that interest us. Of course. And you'll see that in certain industries, there are declarations made, like at Parliament. There's a reason why MPs must declare. Mm -hmm. So in newsrooms, should we perhaps consider that? Is that a, a way of perhaps... Uh, um, monitoring and keeping check of, of and ensuring that we remain objective. Mm. Because now it's left in the hands of the media practitioner. It's, it's up to me to tell my editor, look, I can't write this story because I'm conflicted. Is that how it should be? And these are things we write about every day, that ministers didn't declare their assets. So is that maybe one of, one of the steps that we can look at into addressing this issue? Um, and we, we, we see the many at times you'll see that Media practitioners, some of our colleagues have moved into the space of business also. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in business and, and I apply for a tender or a fishing quota somewhere and I don't succeed, and then a story lands on my desk, what do you expect to happen? So there's a, really, a lot of gray areas in our industry. I, that's always been my view. Um, we, as much as we, as we cry and say self-regulation, self-regulation, self-regulation to which extent? Mm. We are human beings after all. So those are really, I've, I think those, those are some of the issues we should tackle. Um, some of the stories, we, we, you'll see that we are accused of, yes, you guys are being biased and what, what. But the nice thing is, my, my measurement of, of objectivity, especially on my stories, is when you get bashed from both sides, you have a situation where a theory writes a story about, about Swapo, and mm. then Swapo is bashing him, saying you're anti-Swapo. But the opposition are saying, no, this guy, he always writes in favor of Swapo. So those are some of the things we should look at as we move, but it will always be there. It's a conversation, will, it will never end. Um, but as we evolve, we need to find mechanisms to deal with it. So Gwen, universe, I, mean, I, I can just imagine from your vast experience, maybe you can just highlight that for us. What it was, it, <laughs> just, just how you see this, because it's obviously an ever-changing world. So maybe just help us understand from where you sit and where you sat and where you're currently sitting, um, just again to bring, that, to bring that ethical behavior and conduct 
how to bring it home. I can't imagine in your day, like Matthias just highlighted, a journalist also being a business owner and therefore be compromised in writing a specific story on a specific matter. But that is the reality right now. So again, just how do we help ourselves and specifically the profession? And then, uh, Doctor, I want to come to you because about curriculum design at the university and academic level, do we do enough in terms of curriculum design to help our journalists um, not to fall into these ditches? Gwen first. I think two things, Hilda. We need to look at um, both the issue of the quality of journalism, which has been raised uh, by various speakers now, and we also need to look very carefully about at the public. And when I say public, I'm talking across the continent. Afrobarometer surveys, I think it was the 2019 one, showed that there is a declining support among the population of Africa for something like press freedom. Mm -hmm. In tandem with that are declining levels of trust in those we call journalists or the traditional media across the continent. And we have to introspect and ask ourselves why journalism is in the ditch it's in. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, yes, maybe it's an excuse. We can say, well, along came the digital tsunami and social media and the advertisers and the people en masse flocked onto those sites. Yes, that is one factor. But another thing is to look deeply at ourselves. And if you look at the media, which is generally speaking in a state of crisis as we speak, mm -hmm. we all know that's gonna be one of the big topics at this World Press Freedom Day. How the heck do we help to sustain public interest journalism? I'm not talking about now the yellow press because when we talk about the journalistic space, there's a big plethora of, of media, whether it's newspapers or whatever, or radio, which goes from great to less great mm -hmm. to awful, and the same context, the journalists, mm -hmm. sorry to say. But our public is not stupid. Mm -hmm. And when they read a newspaper, and Namibia is a very incestuous society, as you all know, they read a newspaper, they will follow certain people and say, I really like Jemima's reporting at the Sun. That, for me, Jemima's on the on the money. But they'll be very quick to know if another journalist has interests outside of the journalistic world, or is running a nightclub at night, and journalism is just really a way to earn money. Yeah. Um, and I think the public aren't stupid, so again, journalism is no different to any other craft or profession. Mm -hmm. There's good and there's bad in everyone. Let's mm -hmm. just hope the good rises to the surface. Um, but I think it's very important to emphasize that in this crisis of traditional media, and we've got the topical example of this NBC strike, and we're looking at one of the major complaints of the strikers is the situation of contract workers, which yeah. um, Saki told me earlier about 150 contract workers working as journalists. Now, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And because media is struggling, you are finding that across the continent, they are appointing less permanent staff members who have to get benefits and medical aid and all those things, and they're taking on contract workers yeah. which, who are badly paid. And you can imagine the levels of commitment are not the same as a journalist who is really full-time employed. So maybe these are just some of the things that are leading to the sort of, not only the disinterest, but the lack of trust in journalism. And we've got to address those things if we want to go forward and bring back people to credible sources of news and information. And again, lastly, a lot of our traditional media, and I've seen it with some of our local newspapers who would not have done it two years ago, because of the attraction of clickbait online, and again, I question the taste of our audience. Mm -hmm. Let us not just let them off the hook. Mm -hmm. They want that sort of stuff. Yeah. And we need to ask why that is. Yeah. They don't have an appetite for good journalism right now. They really want the scandal and the sensation. So how do we stop our reputable mm -hmm. sources of news and information mm -hmm. from descending to the levels of the basest kind of uh, um, things that are happening on the internet? And there's a lot of this now, who's sleeping with who, mm -hmm. and this... Um, singer in South Africa who had an affair, but he did. I'm seeing the newspapers putting out 
those sort of stories on social media as if it is news. Yeah. And it's a way to try and attract an audience that has fled to social media and that we, we mustn't do that. I'm smiling because yeah. <laughs> Shireen and I had this conversation a week ago because it's, yeah, it's crazy over there. The doctor, curriculum review. If ah, you, yeah. curriculum. And design, specifically and design. Mm. We're on the record, right? Yeah, we're on the record. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, fortunately, the, require, the regulatory requirement is that every four to five years, they should be reviews. And uh, the universities invite various stakeholders uh, to be part of those reviews, in including recent graduates who would have gone into the field and realized possible gaps, uh, current students and, and people in the industry. So fortunately that, ha that happens and it, it helps. Does it happen? Is it, is it a, a provision? It and it a, happens it a, in the actual fact? It is a regulatory provision and it has happened. Certainly, I can speak for NAST. Uh, we conducted some last year. Um, but I, I, it is important, I'm not sure, that the, it's the be-all of ensuring mm -hmm. uh, quality. Here's what I think. I, I'm an idealist. And I believe that we should use our opportunity when we are training journalists, producing journalists, or any other professionals for yeah. that matter, to infuse a passion for the aims of that profession. You're not going to get a doctor who's going to take care of the sick if he or she is not passionate about that. Mm. If it's just a job mm. or a status, you know, I want to be on TV. Mm. What we want to do is, at the same time, as we are changing or revising curriculums and trying to keep up with trends, is uh, work with the material we have with us in class to infuse some kind of vision and passion in this profession. A belief in truth-telling, action. Because there's a danger that we'll get to the point where we say truth is relative after all. So a belief in it, I mean, let me, let me just use an example. If you are running a theological college, and you're training people to believe uh, or to teach something that, after all, may be relative. What kind of pastors and priests are you going to get? So I would say curriculum, design, redesign, reviews are important. Uh, it's good they're carried out, but they, they are carried out with consultation of other stakeholders. But I think we need to do more uh, in terms of how we infuse in those who are being trained a real appreciation of what the profession is all about. Now, I think we would not probably do justice to where we are standing as a country, and I don't want to pick on NBC because they're not here, but we have a very real situation that right now our public broadcaster is on strike. Interestingly, at the time of the 30th anniversary of the Vintage Electoration. Um, and um, we have to speak about, um, I think, Gwen, you talked about uh, the statistic that Saki has, has told you about. And I've spoken to a number of my friends at the NBC as well. That, that is the challenge, that people are correspondents, freelancers, contract workers for a very, very long time. We've also spoken earlier about the, 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 the increase of interns, um, not remaining as interns, but once they've completed the compulsory and mandatory intern period that the universities prescribe, they remain kind of in an intern mode at uh, different entities where they are then employed. I'm just wondering, you know, what that contributes. Specifically, Thierry, when we talk about things like, uh, if you watch the trends in the Namibian press, in the Namibian media space, single source stories, um, it's huge. Single source stories are huge. Anonymous uh, sources are huge. I wonder sometimes if it's a figment of people's imagination or whether they really exist and we people just don't want their names known. Um, fake bylines are uh, huge. Deep fakes are huge. We have quite a lot of stuff going on in this little country of ours. So help me understand um, and I highlighted the NBC situation because it speaks to the crisis that we have. 
help us shrinking revenue streams, um, high costs, no money, no subsidy, and all of this plethora of challenges that we have. Bring it home for us on the ethical component. What can we begin to do? Uh, Is it wrong to have as many interns as we have, for example? I don't even know that it's wrong, but yeah, let me hear. Thanks a lot, Ayod. Uh, um, it is very unfortunate that we are in a situation where pretty much all newsrooms, be it in Namibia or anywhere in Africa, are squeezed uh, in terms of our resources. But the reality is that you can never uh, replace experience uh, with anything. There's been this push or this rush by most uh, newsrooms to maybe where they were supposed to employ Matthias, who is a veteran uh, journalist with a lot of experience in a certain bit. They would rather say to maybe for six, seven um, interns uh, that they can just pay a poultry uh, amount and um, supposedly get the, the job done. But is the job done is, a, is, is, is another question. The issue also of um, newsrooms may be preferring to use um, uh, freelancers, maybe supposedly because uh, it's cheap. But at the end of the day, is it um, a, a cheap? Because there's no way you're going to source an experienced freelance journalist on the market and they're going to come for, for a cheap. So at the end of the day, you're avoiding the unavoidable, where you could probably just have employed somebody who's capable of doing the job um, by going to maybe replace them with a, with a freelance uh, person. I also feel in, 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 in terms of quality, it, it, it goes down um, a lot, like um, what, what, what you've said, Ayuda. If you maybe just have a rundown of most of our publications um, in, in, in the country right now, you get to maybe have a feeling that um, young journalists are being thrown in the deep end. Uh, they, you can, someone just comes from college, suddenly they're doing the work that somebody who probably should have been in the media for six, seven years is doing. And sometimes it becomes so overwhelming to some of these um, young interns or the young journalists that are, that, that are coming because uh, media or, or media owners want to save. But at the end of the day, can you really um, replace quality with um, maybe uh, savings? I, I don't know whether you can replace uh, quality by settling, settling for the least um, uh, 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 in, in terms of ability. It's a, it's a subject that we need to, 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 to discuss. But how do, we dis how do we find solutions for it? Because this, this is the, re the reality. Currently, there is no money. For example, there is no money, revenues are shrinking everywhere. Um, we have to, I guess, depend on these interns and, and try and drive costs down as much as possible. However, we cannot lose sight of the trust issues. How do we do it? I want to get practical and hear how do we do it, the how-tos uh, into the future. What I think, in, in reality, I, I, I know it's, it's a very tricky situation. It's a very hectic situation in terms of uh, cost. But mind you, like I said, you can never ever replace experience with anything. I think it's a hit that all newsrooms have to, to take. Mm. Keeping materials probably who's experience, no matter the cost that is gonna come, it brings a certain level of credibility from the market that, that, that you're competing in, from the advertiser that you're, um, uh, that you're going uh, after. But replacing the same materials who's pretty experienced with three, four interns, it does a dent also on, 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 on your publication, on the market that you are you're supposed to save, where you were supposed to churn out quality that would get the respect of the advertiser, the respect of the reader, the respect of the media uh, consumer. Mm -hmm. You are now replacing that with um, low quality because there is just no, no resources. And more so now, I think, in the, with, with social media, there really is nothing wrong with maybe having a number of interns in the, in, in the newsroom. But the reality is, in terms of quality, there are certain things that young journalists are able to do, and there are certain things that they just cannot do. You would feel pity uh, for a journalist, for young journalists who came from college, being told today you're going to maybe have a one-on-one -on -one interview with them, with the president. The nerve is not even um, there, and these things um, happen. So at the end of the day, the interview might have happened, but is it the quality interview that you were, you were expecting? It's, a, it's, 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 an, it's an issue to be, to be debated. And when these interviews go out there and the readers uh, check, Gwen mentioned a very uh, solid point that media consumers are not passive uh, consumers. They're very critical. When they, that's why you see when these stories are posted maybe on social media, the debate is robust. It goes to a point where maybe it goes to personal attacks on the journalists that does this person really understand what they were supposed to do, were they natured to, 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 to do this. So 
it's something that in the future, whether we like it or not, we might have money or we might not have, newsrooms can just never replace experience and quality with expedience. The then just needs to take that hit and do with it for quality sake. Matthias, I want to come to you. Continuing on the same trend, you spoke about um, we are sometimes oversensitive as journalists. Um, we are, feel we're beyond reproach. Um, and then when we talk about these things of media ethics, and uh, we must place the issue of trust. I think when you mentioned the word trust uh, before our audiences this morning. Now, um, that being the case, that we sometimes sensitive beyond reproach, I want to know, the last time you looked at uh, the self-regulatory you know, principles that we have in front of us as journalists in this country, and specifically when we talk about the digital space, I always struggle with that word. I tried this morning to make sure that I wouldn't do it. Digital space, you see, I can, you know, especially given that reality. Um, is our um, self-regulatory provision, is it sufficient? Is it time for us maybe to critically look at that? Because that would help us, I guess. When last have we looked at that anyway? Yeah, um, constant review, reviews of whether it's a policy or a law is very important just to keep up with times also and the trends. Um, let me come to the issue of, of the curriculum, the question mm. you asked the doctor here. You'll see that uh, newsrooms are moving towards specialization. We have areas where newsrooms get economic students to run the business desk. So I come from an economic class. I don't know anything about media ethics. So what does my employer do to help me in that regard? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, you, you, have, you have the issue of the interns. When, when I started, I was attached to a senior, a senior practitioner. Mm -hmm. That's not there anymore mm -hmm. because the newsrooms, the skills have shrunk. So if I'm a senior in the newsroom, I have so many roles to take on, I don't even have time to, to groom an intern. I don't give them the sufficient attention that they need. So apart from the cost element, what price are we paying mm. to save cost? Mm. And that's, the public doesn't think about the cost, how we must survive as the media. They just want a quality product. They don't care how you arrive at that product. So you cannot tell the, 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 the public that no, we are going to lay off all our senior journalists and just use interns because of the financial situation in the country. That can, it, it can never be justifiable. And I believe like any business, and, and I'm not hitting on anyone, like any business, the moment you outsource your core function, you have a problem. Mm. Imagine Coca-Cola saying, okay guys, uh, Tiri, from now on you are going to, uh, to, to produce our product. So you leave your, your core your core responsibility in the hands of someone else. As a freelancer, I have other things I'm attending to. So mm. I'll always wait, what am I going to do today? Mm. Which project am I going to give attention to? Mm. Instead of having someone in the newsroom where you had, and that's where you have your diary sessions for the day to say, okay, guys, today this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing. And we know as much as it's a noble profession, people need to survive. And that's why you've seen that over the years, Many of our colleagues have used the industry as a stepping stone. Just to perhaps move into PR, the corporate world, where they, where they are better remunerated. You can't blame them in that regard. You also don't want, pre you don't, also don't want people practicing in the space where they don't want to. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like being a nurse or a doctor. It's mm -hmm. really that type of profession. It's either you're in or you're out. You can't be half there. I'm just here for the money. Mm. Or I'm just here until I get a next job. But until in that time frame, while you're looking for a new job, your employer is going to suffer and is going to show in your work. Unfortunately, our work is out there as media. And that's why you see that, unlike, unlike other professions where people have to scramble and submit CVs and what, what, their work is not known, ours is out there for scrutiny every day. So that's why we really need to ensure that the standards are kept high. Mm -hmm. Um, you see, yesterday there was, there was an issue of, there was a collage, there was an issue of uh, the health minister getting a, a jab. One newspaper said this, the other newspaper said, so you see, our work is out. It's not like an engineer, if something happens at the mine, they cover it up and say, okay, let's just fix it, tomorrow we go on. Mm -hmm. So we are really out there. So 
Cost can never be a, a good excuse to shrink and, and to, 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 to juniorize our newsrooms. We need to find other avenues to perhaps other revenue strips in that regard. Mm. But that also leads us to gray areas. If, yeah. if, if I have a media house and I decide that I think I need to, to have a, a sister company that's into construction, mm. at what cost is that also going to come? Mm. So it's, it's a catch-22 situation we're in, but we need to find ways to move with times. Mm. Gwen, just the regulatory framework, the environment, again, the media ombudsman, current co codes of conduct sufficient to the times in which we are operating in? Okay, Hilda, just quickly, if I may, yeah. just uh, pitch on to this, because I think it's an important point, is the issue of multi-skilling of journalists. You know, once upon a time, you were a print journalist, mm -hmm. and you needed to be a very good writer. You needed to write short and sweet and so on, and that was what you did. Nowadays it's required in this digital area that a journalist is not only a writer, they've also got to file a video piece, mm -hmm. they've got to do something for Facebook, they've got to do social media posts. So, and I'll point, not point the finger, but I will gently say to our academic institutions as well, we need to avoid putting out students with a caliber of jack of all trades, master of none or mistress of none. Mm. This is a dilemma that I've seen for a long time in the kind of students that we are getting from these institutions. If you really think of it, what is the fundamental of journalism? Mm -hmm. Good writing skills. Mm -hmm. When do you hear of anybody talking about good writing skills? So anything goes. And Second thing, in tandem with that, is it's a difficult task for journalists to handle this new environment. Um, and the second thing is, journalists aren't reading anymore, and I'm sure Admire mm -hmm. will agree mm -hmm. with me. I would like to pull this room, but I'm afraid people probably won't admit that they're not reading, but they're not reading anymore, and I put myself in that mix as not as much as I used to. Because at night, instead of reading my book, I'm checking the Twitter feed. Yeah. It's unacceptable, guys, as journalists. You've got to be sponges. Those are the things, that is the passion we need to come back to if we want to raise the levels of journalism, whether it's in Namibia or anything else. Um, so that I need to say. On self-regulation, Hilda, I think, you know, a lot has gone into setting up self-regulation because mm -hmm. we all know what the alternate to that is, and that is state yeah. regulation, and is yeah. that something none of us want? Um, I think that it is. it could be better than it's happening at the moment. We have a very committed ombudsman, mm -hmm. uh, John Nakuta. Mm -hmm. We have the case, though, that people are not using the office of the ombudsman. If the media do all these bad things mm -hmm. that people are talking yeah. about, then why is he not being kept busy 24-7? We know that it's affordable, cost-free option for aggrieved readers, viewers, or listeners to access. But again, if a politician has been impugned, the first thing they do is run to the lawyers and go to court. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're not using the system properly, maybe we're not publicizing it enough, that may be something that needs to be done. But I think it can be an effective system. And I have certainly done a number of cases over the last year which have listened to people who had complaints against the media. So I think we need to strengthen it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we need to look at alternatives. And certainly the government control of media is too ghastly to contemplate. I don't even want to go there. Doctor, just, yeah, just the management here of when, when abuses do occur, like Gwen said, when abuses do occur of ethics on the digital space specifically, um, what, what, you know, how can we deal with it? I know that for a lot of the social media giants, there's something called community standards, et cetera, where you get kicked off, et cetera. Um, but in a Namibian space, where we are, how can people deal with abuses um, other than going to court? Yes, of course, we should strengthen the availability of the media ombudsman. But immediately, um, how can I have my grievances adhere to and find relief? Well, uh, at the moment, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, outside of journalists, uh, you cannot take a, a part-time blogger to the ombudsman. Yeah. Am I right? Well, I, I don't see any reason why you can't make a complaint, because yeah. technically they fall in the media spectrum. I, it okay. would be a nice test 
case, yeah. I yeah. think. Okay, I, I mean, I, they took Infomante, for example, as a complaint, mm -hmm. and they're not a member of the of the editors', editors forum. forum. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so technically, it usually applies to membership of the editors' forum. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the ombudsman heard the case, okay. even though there is. So I think it's possible. Well, then that 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 makes it uh, easier for me to answer the question. I, I think then we should publicize and yeah. support that office, so that any infractions uh, by people who publish um, are dealt with, and mm -hmm. are dealt with by practitioners and people who are stakeholders in the industry, yeah. um, and who know that they are doing it for the good of the industry and for the public that, uh, that we actually serve. Mm -hmm. I agree with Gwen that the alternative of state regulation, which, mark my words, will come if self-regulation doesn't work. It mm -hmm. will come. Mm -hmm. um, and that option is, to use yeah. Gwen's words, too ghastly to yeah. contemplate. Yeah. So, to bring the responsibility a bit uh, more home, uh, Thierry, you as a journalist speaking to your peers, obviously peer reviews are very important things. How would you have that conversation with a peer? How can you strengthen the reviews of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, engagement so that we are able to do better in this specific segment? Um, uh, definitely, uh, your peer reviews are very important um, in, um, in, in our profession. I'm pretty happy now that I think uh, at, at, at the current level where we are, there's a lot of interaction between um, journalists, um, whether young or old, but there are platforms where journalists um, engage uh, oftenly, criticize each other sometimes uh, on, on the work that has been done, applaud each other on the work has been done. and. The fact that this uh, is, 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 is happening, it's a good thing. It's, 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 it's a starting point, I think, in terms of improving quality and also abiding by, uh, by, by, by ethics. But whether that is um, enough is it's, 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 it's something else. Because um, I think as, as, as peers in, in, in the industry, we need to also go to a point where if you are criticized by your colleagues, I think on work that you have done, a story that you have uh, churned out, you, don't, you need to go beyond uh, the personal. Don't take it personal. But, at the end of the day, maybe it's simply to improve um, your quality uh, that, that, that you, you, you could have um, gotten out. And um, I also want to support the idea that uh, Matthias has said, I think maybe some 15 years back, uh, the moment you become um, a, a, a journalist, at, at that time it was very normal in order to get a story spiked or just it will never see light at the end of the day. Not because the editor doesn't like you or what, but the story is simply not good enough to to, to, to go out. So I feel that in this modern day, if we really also want to improve quality, we can never run away from that fact where because the, the, the skills are not, are not really there or because the, the, the resources are not really there, we end up churning out um, everything else. I think we need to go back to, that, um, uh, to those basics where if a story is not good enough, let a story be cured as a way of, 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 of strengthening um, uh, our journalists to do better, as a way of strengthening our journalists to, uh, to, to research. But when you get to a point where whatever you get um, goes out there because there are no resources, at the end of the day, we can point fingers to say maybe the conveyor belt is not doing enough, the colleges are not doing enough, but the issue is within the newsrooms, our backroom staff, are they taking the difficult decisions like spiking a story to strengthen uh, the ability of a journalist or to improve the quality that, that a, a journalist go, goes out there? And also now that I think we have structures, maybe in Namibia you have a, a media union and um, the, the ETAS forum has been there for quite some time, but you have a, a media union. I suppose some of these uh, platforms should also be used to open um, um, debate. Let's have robust uh, discussions among peers, among journalists um, uh, themselves about the quality of work um, that, that goes there. The more this, uh, this happens, you eventually see that um, quality would, um, uh, would, 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 would improve. Then maybe um, last uh, but not least, I think as journalists in terms of keeping our own quality, we need to move away. I, I, I don't know whether it's practical, but we need to desist from the click um, uh, syndrome, like what um, uh, the mm -hmm. doctor said. Whatever Stiri sees on, 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 on Twitter, before he even verifies this, is probably the first to, to share. Doesn't even check um, the quality of the content he's, he's sharing. Doesn't even check the authenticity of, of, of the content that, it, that he's sharing. So I think us as journalists, 
in as much as we need to compete in, in, in these spaces that have come with our social media, we need to compete, we need to be versatile, we need to be felt. We need also to make sure that whatever we put out there is quality enough, and that quality can only come from research, it can only come from reading, it can also come from consultation and debate with, uh, with, with colleagues. Very good. We're going to open the floor now for questions uh, from those of you who are with us in the room. And we're also taking questions from our online audience. Um, is there anybody who would like to start uh, by posing the very first question to any of our panelists? And panelists also, at the back of your mind, keep concluding remarks there. So, shelly -Ann, can we please get a microphone just to the front? Introduce yourself, please, and pose your question. Thank you. If you can just bring the sanitizer with you. You are free to keep your mask on completely when you pose your question. We should be clear enough to hear it, just to make sure that we abide by COVID-19 standards. I'm only using my mic exclusively. I have not shared it with anybody, and it's been sanitized, just so that you know. Um, good afternoon. My name is Shiligan Peterson. I'm a journalist with the Namibian. Um, well, Matthias did touch on it. Perhaps we can have more comments from the other panelists on perhaps a journalist council. What are your thoughts on that? I know there's been a lot of calls for some sort of way to vet journalists, um, to look at uh, you know, what they've been sort of, um, what the way they have interest in. And there's also been a conversation around you know, the passion in journalism has sort of faded away and we're just filling the gaps as all of you guys have concurred to. So what are your thoughts on perhaps having a journalist council? Yeah, Gwen? Um, I'm not entirely sure. It's taken us a long time for the journalists to get a union off the ground. And we're very happy that it's happened. And there's an editor's forum. I don't know about the council, what it would, or how it would be constituted, but I think a forum for that kind of discussion could be a very, very valuable thing to have. But I'm not sure about the council itself. And also I'm very wary when people start raising questions about vetting of journalists. And because then we go back to the good old licensing of journalists, which I think happens in Zimbabwe at my, where you can't practice as a journalist mm -hmm. unless you have a license. Uh, again, if you look at countries like Uganda, uh, whether it's bloggers or even social media influencers, as they call them now, I still don't know quite what that is, but they usually have a lot of followers. They're requiring now to be registered and then pay a levy and pay a fee. So I'd be very nervous of going towards the, the licensing of journalists, but I would say that we do need to up the skills and get journalists really on top of their game, but to do that without kind of a vetting process, if possible. Uh, yes, it's a, it's, I think it's a conversation worth having. I, I wouldn't immediately put my full-throated support behind it, but I think it is a conversation because other professions actually have this kind. I think by councils you mean something that's looking at standards, you know, who, who, who practices, qualifications, etc. I, I, I don't think it's a ghastly idea personally. I, I think it's a conversation worth having. Okay. Did you have specifically thinking around the issue like Matthias highlighted declaration of their own individual assets, for example, where they're involved? Shelley, I'm speaking to you. Do you. Would you like the microphone back? Can we have the microphone back to her, please, just so she can elaborate a little bit more on her question? Uh, it's all right, Gwen. Just you keep yours, Gwen. For, no, okay. Gwen, you keep yours for COVID reasons. Let's keep yours. Uh, okay, yeah, but it's um, all right, thank you. <laughs> so what I'm thinking is, um, taking from what Matthias said, you know, um, we have a, a, a profession that is entrusted with disseminating information. Mm -hmm. We have theories that we learn in university, but it's very much active in the media space about gatekeeping and agenda setting. We see it every day when we read the papers and what the stories are. So um, when we have people coming into the industry, um, and you guys have all said that sort of the quality mm. is sort of questioned at times. If, if a council is perhaps constituted in such a way to look at those things and point it out and then, yes, we have a media ombudsman, but a council to, to 
mostly like deal with some of these issues mm. of, of interns coming in, mm -hmm. of quality of stories, of gatekeeping, of agenda setting, to sort of prevent it before it happens. If I can take that. Um, Council of the wise, almost like, that's, that's what I hear you say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, um, okay, I hear you, uh, Shelly. I'm, uh, I'm not really so sure what uh, the role of a council would serve, especially at this time. But for me, I believe the issue is coming down. What you are emphasizing on is on quality, right? Uh, the quality of journalists that we groom, the quality of content that journalists produce at the end of the day. I think that's where it's coming from. I certainly believe that we cannot move away from the basics. There's a point that Matthias um, raised of uh, when you get an intern coming from college, there are basics that are supposed to be done by any normal editor or by any structure in a newsroom. An intern is attached to a senior journalist for quite some, some time and uh, they learn through. Sometimes they, they might not even see their byline in the, in the paper. The, the, the senior journalist can just say, okay, Shelly, can go and interview this person, ask this. You bring the information, literally you are a runner. You have to start that you get to a point where you can now put together your story. And this person who's guiding you, is it's for quality assurance. You've written your story, now you've gotten to a point where you can even see, okay, I can even go on the front page. It, it creates, it completes the conveyor belt from college until the person goes into the newsroom. And also in terms of doing the basics right, there, there are mechanisms in any newsroom that used to be used in the past, but I don't know if people use this. There is no harm in Shelligan losing his, his or her byline because she did not do enough to, cut, to bring out a good story. Mm -hmm. An editor has the right to just take off your name, beef the story, strengthen it, and put stuff right there. It's, it's not meant to break you down, but it's meant to improve your ability. It's also meant to strengthen your, uh, the quality that, that you put there. So when you go through all these things, these are basics, but unfortunately, because maybe of resources like what um, Matthias said, we don't have so many senior reporters uh, in, in, in the newsroom. And the few that are there, the question is, if Thierry is a senior reporter in the, in, 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 in the newsroom, does he really have the time to also nature others? Because, I mean, nurturing is a very important um, aspect of, of, of newsrooms. Most of us senior journalists, I really don't care. I've done my quota for the day. I go out, whether you are going to improve, it's not really much of my, my, my problem, but we need also to stick to the basics. Senior journalists maybe must open up to training. Well, I know it takes uh, quite a lot, but these are basics. So eventually the quality would, um, would, would improve. Okay, we'll come to the floor just now for a further question. I just want to remind those of you in attendance, before you leave, please fill in the register those of you who did not, uh, before you leave, that's important for us. And the panelists, there's a specific register standalone for you to also just fill out your name quickly, just for uh, information's sake, please, if we could have that. Um, Follow-up question before we come to Calvin. I'm wondering, so I have, a, I guess, I have a dual view on journalism in the country, having been a business owner and also having been in the media space for a very long time. I'm wondering sometimes if, don't we struggle with, with the change that is required? Clearly I hear there's a change that is required here in journalism this morning. We know the business model is old. And because the business model is old, the type of journalist that we trained, certainly that's not the system for the future as well because there is the di digital component now as well, the multi-skilling component as, of it as well. Uh, do journalists find it hard to accept that their trade, their profession is not purist, or do they want to be purists? Like we are just journalists, we are just writing high level, credible information. Don't bog us down with planning and time management and fact checking and things like that. Is that maybe part of our problem, the way that journalism understands the profession itself? Because, well, yeah. I think, again, that somebody raised it right in the beginning, the question of definition, Hilda, mm. who or what is a journalist. And as was mentioned earlier, somebody said it's, it, journalism is a profession. Well, it's not really. Mm. Because if it was, then we would have a council like architects or lawyers or whatever. Mm. Uh, so I see it more as a craft. Um, but, um, you know, a lot is required of, of journalists today that wasn't the case before, as I, as I mentioned earlier. They really have to do a lot of things and to try and do them well. So 
I would say we, we and, and we often call people journalists who aren't really. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it was kind of a time-tested thing that the writers were the journalists, the photographers were the photographers, mm -hmm. and there were fairly defined beats and areas for yeah. journalism. Now yeah. anybody who works in media is a journalist, and mm -hmm. that's not, strictly speaking, the case. So perhaps we also need to apply that description uh, more, uh, I don't want to be a purist, but but to actually apply to the journalists rather than media workers. Mm -hmm. Because there is a difference. Those mm -hmm. who are doing production, mm -hmm. they're not involved in actually content, is usually the journalists. So again, now today, but you will find most of these young journalists who are journalists still have to carry their camera and do a video and do an interview as if they were on television or something. Yeah. So again, all those yeah. definitions are, yeah. are, are being confused and that could be leading to a bit of unraveling because you can't do all of those things mm -hmm. to the best of your ability. Absolutely. And if that one journalist had just written a story or posted a video, they could have edited the video properly and or they could have... But now it's the rush to get into print and to get online and, and a lot is lost in the process, to be quite honest. Calvin, do you have a microphone? Thank you. My name is Kevin. <coughs> this is a question for you, uh, uh, sir. I don't know if you can, he you can hear me Doctor? clearly. Doctor, mm -hmm. yes. Um, in terms of uh, in the learning process that you put through the students of journalism that are then supposed to get into our area, to what extent do you imbue in them not only the technical aspects of the curriculum, but aspects to do with value and virtue, virtues of hard work, mm. ability to be flexible, perseverance, fearlessness. Because I'm asking this question because I've gone through an institution where ultimately, when you get into the newsroom, you have to cultivate, you have to look from within yourself to see if you have those virtues that you were not taught at school because you were put through the technicalities of how to report, you know, the theories, the ethics. But when it comes to how do I conduct an interview with the president and what kind of an attitude and character do I need to exhibit? How do I play around and navigate in the newsroom where you have somebody like Thierry who's there to say, I want to educate you, but I feel like I know what I'm doing. But, I, but, but in that particular setup, I need to be flexible enough, flexible enough to be able to learn because we are also dealing with interns who don't take lightly when you correct them or when you seek to, to educate them, who don't take it lightly when you seek for them to put extra to what they are because they come to work at 7 o'clock. They believe that they are supposed to go home at 5 o'clock. But we've got an important event at 8 o'clock in the evening that needs to be covered, and we need that extra push in you to be able to go after that particular kind of work. So how do you, and to what extent do you imbue these virtues and values outside of the scope of technicalities? I, I really love that question. Because it, it demonstrates the need for, for what we teach to include values, and values have to be internalized. Mm. If everything is about theory and reproducing the theory in an exam and getting an A grade, we've defeated the purpose. I go back to the theological college. What kind of pastor or minister are you going to produce if it's all about learning the history and theory and getting the A grade? What kind of pastor will you produce? So we have that responsibility. Now, unfortunately, I'm not sure that writing it into the curriculum in itself will help. The educator has to understand, and this is where educators who have some exposure to practice uh, might you know, be useful in this exercise, has to understand what is involved in this, I was about to say profession, but my senior said it's a craft, in this craft, <laughs> you know, what is it? What is involved in you understanding that you need to stay until 8 o'clock for a function or because the editor hasn't yet cleared it? And the editor needs you around so that you can defend your piece. If you go at 5 o'clock, who's the editor going to talk to? What is it, even if you're not paid the overtime, and that's a sore point, but what is it in you 
that makes you appreciate the need to go that extra mile. It's values. So absolutely, we need to do that. Are we doing enough of it? I suspect not. Yeah? But the challenge here is also in the, the educator having it imbued in themselves so that it's not something that you write on the curriculum, you know, that these values must be. Uh, but you, you understand that what I'm producing here is competent, theoretically knowledgeable, but also people who are value driven. I love your question. I really do. Matthias, a contribution to that question? Yeah, um, I think I have a, a different outlook on it because you'll see that most of the values that we feel a journalist should have within them, within them are to a certain extent clashing with the type of society in which we live today, the type of society which we are building towards. Let me, let me play devil's advocate. If, if I was a female and say perhaps a single mother, you say there's an event at eight, yeah, that falls under my beat, and I have to be home to tend to my child. What aspect do you what 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 do you what do you put in place as an employer to ensure that for me as a female reporter, our system caters for my needs? Because for me to stay after five. If my job, if my job uh, description says eight to five, so it means that the extra three hours is, is the patient part of me. But what about my responsibility at home? What do we do in that regard? And we already have an issue where you see, and the conversation is there, although we don't want to have it, of uh, men climbing the ladder faster than women. So also as employers in the newsroom, how do we tackle that? You can't just say, no, you are employed, you are a journalist, you need to go cover that at all expenses. How do we bring in that conversation in our industry also? It's fine, we need to have those values of hard work and so on. But how do we bring in that? At least now we have the online, the digital world where, our week, where we can work remotely. But some of the values, I don't think they are in tandem with where we are now. <laughs> it's a society. And Gwen and I will say we have done this too. <laughs> we were pregnant. <laughs> yes, Gwen, go for yeah, it. <laughs> I just want to add to, to what Matthias uh, said there. And, um, yeah, a lot more needs to be done for women journalists in the workplace. Let me put that on record. But again, it comes back to the values, Matthias. And I don't care whether it's a man or a woman. If you go into journalism and if it's hard news journalism, there's other softer, cushier aspects of journalism where you wouldn't work past five o'clock or whatever, but if you're really now a hard-nosed investigative journalist or political journalist, you go into that with the understanding that it's 24-7. Yep. And I don't give a darn as a former journalist, editor, if my phone rang at midnight, I answered that phone. I had no compunction if I had to go out. And again, for women, it's very important that, and I know over the decades, as I've worked with other African countries in this whole scenario of women can't be journalists because their husbands say they must be home to cook a meal. Nonsense to that. It's time women also have supportive home environments mm -hmm. where they can also go out and do the jobs and follow their passion and not say, I can't do this job because my husband is not going to tolerate that I'm home late. That having been said, I absolutely agree with Matthias. You can't expect a single mother, for example, to suddenly drop everything. But the point is go into journalism knowing that call is going to be on your time and the test of whether you're a good journalist or not ultimately will be according to whether you're prepared to go above and beyond to make a success of it. Sorry, but it's just facts. It is so in all careers. That's my allowable com com comment. Just as a moderator, I just want to also add something. <laughs> Eddie, you have no questions this is because the president is not here. <laughs> you only ask him. <laughs> On, okay. Uh, my name is Edward. I am a journalist with NAMPA. Uh, 
Ish, uh, I wasn't really <laughs> gonna ask, but I, I think it's a comment that was made by Gwen earlier on. The NBC situation, perhaps it's for all of us to analyze, uh, especially when it comes to the way forward. Of course, from a union's uh, vintage point, we all want uh, the employees' uh, benefits and all these things that uh, the contract workers to be employed and all that uh, for that to take place. But then again, you come to the reality of NBC, uh, where you find uh, a company that uh, has a historic debt that stands at uh, almost 500 million. Uh, you have a situation whereby their wage bill is uh, currently at uh, 260 million annually. And you, you have a government that we write about every day that uh, is actually struggling to make ends meet, uh, on the other hand. So you have these 100 and, uh, uh, 131 NBC employees who are on contract. How does NBC deal with that? Because now, when you, one of the reasons why they've not employed these guys on a full-time basis is because, uh, of course, employing somebody on a full-time basis comes with added responsibilities to the NBC. Currently, the NBC's, uh, uh, what is it? The, what, what is that amount that you pay, is it the housing allowance? I think they contribute almost 70% to employees. Is it time that the NBC perhaps revisits those, uh, some of those uh, issues? Perhaps how do, we, how do we address such a dilemma in an, in an economic climate like this one? That's the first one. Uh, and maybe the second one, uh, I think again it ties in with what Gwen, and I don't know, Thierry or Matthias uh, mentioned, whereby we train, and then that ties in with the curriculum review that uh, you, you've embarked on. Uh, when most journalists come into the industry, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they hardly know anything when it comes to the practicality or the practical side of journalism. Of course, there's internships and all that, but Today we are struggling, we have a crisis when it comes to health reporters, for example. Uh, we, I don't know if we have any at the moment. You have a situation whereby most uh, newsrooms are, uh, have to rely on, uh, on hiring perhaps economists to take care of their, of their business bit. You go to the politics. What are our universities doing in ensuring that at least uh, when it comes to the major bits in journalism, at least you, the, 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 the student has that basic understanding of the beat. I think with those uh, few remarks, uh, that's it. Thank you. As you respond to that, can I also ask that you conclude um, in regards to this discussion? Because we're almost at the end of our time available. So Thierry, respond and conclude, please. Thank you, as we move okay. down. Thanks, Edda. Um, the, the NBC scenario that um, Eddie uh, just painted is a very, uh, it's a very difficult situation um, uh, that we are in. But I just think going forward, um, innovation is the is, is, is the key uh, for for a bigger broadcast uh, company like that. I mean that enjoys the vast monopoly of of, of the whole uh, country. They need to be making more than they are making now, and it's very possible that they can make more than what they are making now, and um, uh, sort out the situations with uh, with employees. And I also feel pity for the, for the journalists that are maybe on contract. I mean, we need to also realistically move away from the noble profession belief. You cannot have a journalist who is seen every other time on, 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 on TV or writes big stories, but they can't even afford to pay their own basic uh, rent. So it's, these are realities that we need to, 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 to sync with. On con in conclusion, I think uh, I would want to touch on the aspect like uh, the, that Eddie raised on, 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 on improving uh, quality or also encouraging journalists maybe to venture in, uh, in, in different uh, bits. I think it comes down to the, not only the, 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 the training colleges, but it also comes down to the, to the newsrooms. Are our newsrooms incentivizing well for people to go after these bits? I really do not believe that you need an economist to write um, a business story. I'm, I'm a business journalist, but I've never been to you to an economic uh, school. It's something that I pretty much um, built interest in because the incentives were there. So our editors need to be able to incentivize um, or, or to, to find a way of encouraging younger journalists coming that there's nothing wrong with writing a youth. In fact, it is a better way because you're most likely gonna be guaranteed of a job because there are not so many uh, doing it. There is not really 
nothing, there's nothing wrong with an editor encouraging our female colleagues to do sports. Reality is that if you are a female and you do sports, chances are you're going to have a full-time job because there are not so many um, uh, doing it. So I think it, it comes down to the backroom staff and also the motivation of, 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 of journalists uh, themselves. First and foremost, you are journalists today. I think uh, you was just joking now saying they did it with, with, with their age when, when, when you're pregnant, you have to go. You are a journalist first. When you get into a newsroom, you can be asked today, you go and write sports. You don't have to ask anything. It's what you are told. You go and do it. Today, you can be asked today, you're moving from the sports desk, you go to business. So be versatile. T try to test all the bits that are in the newsroom. It's very unfortunate that most of our young people get into a newsroom and suddenly Thierry says today, I'm a sports journalist. You can never be a sports journalist when you started today. Do anything and everything for a certain period and then find where your art is and eventually you will move where you can be better. Thank you. Doctor? Oh, great. Um, so I have to include in my concluding remarks my profound appreciation for this forum because uh, we all improve by interacting across mm. sectors. Um, from the training institution's point of view, uh, we are listening and we've heard a lot. Uh, the one point about specialization, and I, I take Thierry's point that the newsrooms have their role to play. That's absolutely true. Uh, but we have to also offer on our menu the opportunities of exposure uh, to those kind of bits. Uh, health reporting, look how, look how critical it is. Mm. Science reporting, business mm. reporting, we have to do more. Mm. We have to. We've, we've heard that. But I, I think I'm, I'm in awe at... Uh, what this platform has achieved and how, how useful, how profitable it is for us to speak to each other. If we could do this more, I think we'll be in the right place. Thank you. Matthias? Yeah, um, I think on Eddie's uh, NBC uh, remark slash question, um, the issue of, of the housing and so on, um, legally, I, I I doubt you'll be able to change my working conditions just because of my benefits. Mm. It's, it's going to be a challenge. Mm. The Labour Commissioner will be overwhelmed with cases if that happens. So the, I agree with Thierry. There, there are innovative ways to look at, and perhaps they should look at their business model. But uh, we, we, we are in solidarity with our colleagues at NBC, and we hope that they find the best solution. Um, from my side, I think in, conclu in conclusion, it's just I'll highlight the self-development aspect, uh, both from, from the employer side and from us as practitioners. Um, we, we never stop learning. Um, luckily, these days, there's a lot of online platforms, coaching platforms going on. Um, big universities around the world offering free seminars, journalism seminars, and so on. Um, also, let's, let's keep on applying to attend journalism seminars in other jurisdictions. Um, we, we, can, we can only grow. I know it's, we are in a tough phase, but, but I th we, we will make it. We, let's remain resolute. And this type of interaction is what, what we should have. And let's make use of uh, the gurus while they are here. People like uh, Gwen and Doc. Before you expire. <laughs> yeah, so with, with that said, let's enjoy our few days at least uh, the world the attention is on all of us as media practitioners so let's enjoy and all the best Gwen you have the last say okay thank you Hilda um, and for a well moderated discussion and thank a good you. chance for through discussion and introspection which I think is absolutely vital and I too have learned a lot here today but just finally I want to say that you know to get back to the issue of ethics that journalists are, after all, a product of their own society. Mm. And we cannot have this discussion without looking at, in this case, we're talking about Namibia, a broader country, which is, to be brutally honest, in a state of moral collapse. Um, from the rampant corruption to gender-based violence, it's just... Things are really bad, I think, and that's obviously exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and economic circumstances, and that affects the media as well. So I would just say, to bring it back to a positive note, that hopefully, and we so lack role models, mm. ethical role models, mm. that's the other thing. If we had more of them, 
uh, it could change people's views, it could change journalists' thinking about these things. But I think it's very important that we look back at the role of the journalist. And also, because World Press Freedom Day is just around the corner, to pay tribute to our journalists here locally, and maybe I should add the adjective good journalist, mm -hmm. um, but to pay tribute to them because they sacrifice a lot in really doing what is essentially a public service and trying to keep the people of Namibia informed. That role has to not only remain, and we need to save good journalism, but must also increase. So that, as I say, hopefully in time, I mean, my wish would be that we bring people back mm. to the sources of good information, reputable uh, news sources, which they can use in their own lives to become more active citizens and participants in our democracy in, in an informed way. And that in turn will improve online debate. So I'd like to just end by paying tribute to not only them, but journalists around the world, mm. many of whom have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, to informing people. We've bashed them quite a lot here today, but as I say, I think good journalism does a tremendous job around the world. And I do wish that the broader Namibian public would also, because they enjoy bashing journalists, make mm. no mistake, also think very deeply about to what extent good journalism, and don't just think of the politics mm. and the front pages. Yeah. There's the community reporting, yeah. the health reporting, how much of a difference good journalism has made in their lives over the years. And we need to, as journalists, rise to that challenge and keep delivering quality information and striving for the truth at all times. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it is appropriate just to thank um, those who made today possible. Obviously, our panel, just exceptional, thank you. Let me also thank the Internet Society of the, the Namibia chapter specifically. Nashilongo, are you in the room? Yeah, she is. Uh, thank you very much for putting this together, an excellent job. Uh, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, thank you very much. Remember the list that you must fill out. It's important for them that you, all of your names appear on that specific list. Then Nashilongo's company, Namtswe Digital, I think I got it correct. Facebook, thank you. Informante, thank you for streaming this. And the very much thank you to the Namibia University of Science and Technology. And thank you for all of you in attendance. I think we've come to the end of our events here this morning. Um, is there something I need to say? The people who are, yeah, the people who are watching us as well. And then we have a final closing remarks from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, right? Yes. If you would please come to the front just to deliver your closing remarks. But thank you also from me. This will be my last statement. After you have spoken, I will not speak. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you could just come here. You'll keep your, you'll keep your mask on. No, no. Um, you, would you like to, can we just have the sanitize, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. We appreciate the uh, great efforts you put into keeping this discussion forum today uh, together for everyone who attended and also to the audience listening and uh, watching um, on the live stream. I would also thank, uh, extend a special thank you to the uh, panelists and um, we appreciate your inputs today and for joining us in this very crucial discussions and then also a very big thank you to, to Informante for the live stream made possible today to host this hybrid discussion platform and then lastly we would like to just extend a very very hearty uh, thank you to our partners the Internet Society as well as to Facebook and of course, NAST. And um, then we also have the uh, Namibia Media Professionals Union. So thank you very much for all our partners and uh, the sponsors. And uh, on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, Namibia Angola offices, we herewith express our sincere gratitude to form part of this year's World Press Freedom Day commemorations. 
with the title Information as a Public Good. I believe that the topics covered in today's panel discussion pave the road and opening the commemorations for this year. And we shall continue hearing your cries as journalists also and to the experts, including the panelists, comments today are well noted in terms of future discussions. Uh, just a brief intro to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. We are a German political foundation with our headquarters in Berlin. We have uh, about 80 offices worldwide with over 120 active projects. Uh, the foundation contributes toward the promotion of democracy, rule of law and human rights. With our work underlined by basic principles of freedom, justice and solidarity, the CAS encourage a continuous dialogue at a national and international level. And as we have uh, um, close, close off today's session, I will extend the same message as we have in this morning's public update and acknowledgement ceremony at the Comas Regional Council. The CAS encourage a continuous dialogue and, and at national and international level, as well as the exchange between key role players, decision makers on a multitude of insights. Namibia, compared to other African nations, has continued to rank highly in terms of press freedom, although this could still be improved. With this, our offices remain dedicated to continue strengthening dialogue and multifaceted collaborations, particularly in light of the rapidly emerging digital front by means of capacity building and public discussion forums such as this forum we conclude today. To ensure Namibia's press freedom ranking in the World Index is boosted once again. CAS have great confidence in the successful implementation and sustainability going forward. To promote the ongoing dialogue between the media, decision makers and the broader public. Regarding pertinent challenges and integrity of information for the public good and ultimately in promoting a new age of democratic governance in Namibia. Thank you very much. Thank you.